This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Your host, Andrew Donaldson. This is Herb Tell. Okay, welcome back to Herd Tell. He is the most visited guest in the history of the Herd Tell program because he's just that much fun. He's just that smart. He's even handsome with his new haircut and his wonderful background to the Burt Reynolds Nebula. Our good friend, Dr. Michael Siegel. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you, my friend? Unfortunately, we got a little bit of a dark topic for you today, but because we respect you so much, we think this is the perfect person to talk about it. I feel about this topic kind of like I do cancer. It's like, okay, is there really more cancers or are we just learning more about it and we see more about it and it's louder? What do you think it is when we deal with something like anti-Semitism? Because we know human nature doesn't change. We know, you know, prejudices and bigotries and things like that don't really change. Is there more of it or is it just louder, faster, stronger, and the really bad people can congregate more easily nowadays? I, I think it's the latter. I think there's uh, less anti-Semitism than there used to be. Um, certainly from when I grew up and uh, in the 1980s, uh, when I was a, a kid, I didn't, wasn't exposed to a lot of anti-Semitism, but there was an incident where uh, a cross was burned on the lawn of our synagogue while it was under construction. And uh, I did know friends who experienced uh, violence, actually, uh, because of anti-Semitism. So I think that sort of thing is reduced. But I think in the age of the Internet, any kind of extreme voice tends to get amplified. You know, that, you know, you had, for example, you know, we, there was this debate in 2016 over the deplorables around Donald Trump. And I think that was a very tiny fraction of his support. But with the Internet, that tiny fraction can amplify up so much so that they become very very loud and especially i think you know the media has a tendency to give a lot of attention to people not unjustifiably so when you hear someone espousing violence and discriminatory views you you definitely want don't want to ignore that and let it fester but uh, i do think that things have gotten better generally in that i just you know and especially comparing to when my father grew up and and things like that when they had you know, major schools had quotas on how many Jews they could admit, where, you know, people, he was, you know, he knew doctors who were fired because they were Jewish, you know, on a kind of slim pre- pretext. Um, he knew people in the military who were not promoted because they were Jewish. I mean, it wasn't said openly, but it was pretty obvious what was happening. That sort of thing has disappeared or at least significantly reduced. But I do think with your, when you're talking about extreme groups that are way out there, that especially with the internet, that has to have a tendency to amplify their voices and give them a very loud reach. Let's back up for a second, because um, I know we hear things in history, but we don't put personal faces to it. You're talking about growing up in the 80s. I've talked about, you know, when I was growing up in the 80s, even though you're a little bit older than I am, you know, we talk about that World War II generation. Like if you saw an older man, you just assumed he was a World War II vet, right? You grew up in a Jewish community you still had that Holocaust generation. There was lots of those folks. They're almost all gone now. Yeah. Is there a generational difference now besides the technology and that stuff? That's just a huge generational difference because that working knowledge, unfortunately, that word of mouth tradition, that's almost gone now. Has that changed it too? And has that changed how the community views some of this stuff, do you think? Um, that's a very good question. And I don't know that I have a very good answer to it. During... The 1970s and 1980s were kind of an era where the awareness of the Holocaust in particular came into flower. But before then, a lot of Holocaust survivors would talk about how they were kind of discouraged about talking about it. I talked to a Holocaust survivor who came to this country and tried to tell his family what had happened and they didn't want to hear about it. 
because it was it was so horrible. And there was a time when people wouldn't talk about these things. And then that started changing. And I think we thankfully, you know, a lot of these people are dying off, but we also have the Shoah Project, which has preserved a lot of their firsthand testimony. We have a lot of great documentaries. The Shoah documentary is very long and very arduous, but I think it's very good for interviewing people on all sides, not just the people who were the victims, but the perpetrators and the bystanders and so forth. I think we, in the digital age that has allowed a lot of these voices to be kept alive long after the, the survivors are going so that if you if you seek it out, if you want it, you can you can find that information. I mean, there has been a tendency to decide to, to, to sort of try to bury these things in the past. Uh, just to give another personal example, uh, in the 1910s, a businessman named Leo Frank was accused of murdering one of his uh workers a, a young teenage girl and uh was almost was very likely innocent and was lynch, but was convicted and eventually lynched by a mob my grandparents grew up during that they were teenagers they would not talk about it until the 1980s then people started talking about it and there were movies about it and suddenly they were you know they were reluctant but people would talk about it then so these these the willingness to talk about these things kind of waxes and wanes but i think uh as you know we are losing that firsthand testimony but with the digital age and especially the show project that has allowed a lot of that firsthand testimony to be preserved you said something really important dr michael siegel joining us our very good friend here on hard tell i think you said something really important about that project that yes they interviewed the survivors and they interviewed some of the perpetrators one of the really important groups that we don't talk about, and it's not just anti-Semitism, it's race-based hatred, religious-based hatred, class, whatever kind of hatred you want to talk about, the bystanders, because that's the group that does the enabling. That's the group that usually controls the power structure that the hatred operates out of. Anytime you have hatred and abuse that comes from hatred, there's that big swath of bystanders. And I think, this is my opinion, you tell me what you think, I think what we're seeing digitally is, yeah, I think it's better in the real world, but digitally, I think you're getting some real hard dividing lines between that extreme element. But I think the people that are bystanderish or bystanderish tendencies are really exposing themselves online in this day and age. Is that fair to say it that way? I, I think so. Um, you you can look at, at history and see that the kind of horrors we talk about with the Holocaust, or even just separating from the Holocaust to, to other to other incidents in, the, in history with other groups that have been oppressed or been the subject of mass murders, the vast majority of people just sort of want to go along. You know, they they I mean, they might be against it, but they don't want to do anything about it, and they just want to get through their day and, and so forth. And that what that does is enables those tiny minorities of really bad people that gives them the freedom to act. And so I think, you know, I mean, not just when we're talking about anti-Semitism, we're talking about any sort of ism, there is a responsibility of people to, to speak out and say, no, this is not acceptable and, and to oppose when they can. Because the vast, you know, one of the things I've, I've said on my uh, YouTube channel is I, the vast majority of people are good, but we are very easily tempted when there's, you know, something at stake like money or honor to do the bad thing. We're very good at rationalizing, not acting when we see something, you know, that's wrong. And uh, that's a that's a difficult tendency to overcome, but one that we sort of have to. And especially in this digital age when extreme voices, even if you're talking about only 1%, can be amplified up so dramatically and can have such dramatic power, um, way out of proportion to their numbers, I think uh, there is responsibility of people to uh, to not stand by. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger 
for the ones who get it done. Yeah, Dr. Michael Siegel joining us. I, I find it interesting. Like I've seen it in my own children. I have teenagers through young adults now as children especially the two younger teens, they just have zero tolerance for, for stuff like this because they've been, you know, you know, they're very, very online. They've been, you know, they've moved around the world a little bit. I hope that I've tried to teach them a little bit along with their mother, but mostly it's just them. They have such a basis of knowledge because of the technology. They're exposed to a wide swath of culture that, you know, previous generations weren't. They have zero tolerance for this stuff. Like as soon as they hear some, they're like, oh no, that's racist or that's anti-Semitic or that's quiet. Like they just zero tolerance for it inside of the community though. Cause you're raising your own children now. What is it like now in the digital age? Because it is different. It's more, maybe it's more online than just somebody making a comment on the street. Like it used to be then. How does that change in the online communities inside of the Jewish community, especially like you're raising your own kids, because now you've got this whole digital sphere. That's a whole different ball game, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, it'd be difficult for me to speak to for the entire Jewish community because everyone's experience is different. I would say that talking to people, it seems like they're more, there's less fear of the kind of institutional discrimination and so forth that used to be faced and used to be more common where you had, you know, clubs that would exclude Jews and colleges that would have quotas on Jews and that sort of thing, and more fear of you know, what happened in Pittsburgh, where a lone guy, you know, with, you know, hatred amplified by internet voices went in into the synagogue and massacred a bunch of people. There's more fear, I would say, of that sort of the power of a single person to do horror than there is of institutional horror at this point. But again, that might not be the perception of other people, so I'd be hesitant to speak for everyone. But like you, I've seen with my daughter the same thing. She's, you know, with the teen, she also has very little tolerance for that sort of thing. And uh, and her school has sort of that tolerance. There was a, a thing at one of the schools where some kid wore like a, a had like a Nazi symbol. And they, this was this caused a lot of controversy because the vast majority of students were like, this is not cool. This is not funny. This is not ironic. You need to get rid of that. Michael Siegel joining us again. That's Dr. Michael Siegel to you folks. If we're talking science, when we're just talking on ordinary times, we just call him Hal because of his uh, Twitter handle that you see there. You mentioned Pittsburgh, unfortunately. We know what happened at the Tree of Life Synagogue. We've had other instances of it. Thankfully, the recent headlines have been thwarted attacks, but there are people out there that keep targeting Jews and Jewish communities and synagogues. I lived in Germany twice. Uh, synagogues on holy, high holy days and on, you know, for normal weekly service, they have armed polizei out front. They just do. That's just reality over there. The house, I'm a Baptist, the house of worship I worship at. In fact, the last two churches I've attended, they both have armed security during service or I won't attend there. That's something I'm just cognizant of. Do y'all think about it? You mentioned it. How readily is it in people's mind when they're just going to a normal service or Shabbat or whatever the case may be, a high holiday, maybe especially, is it on people's minds because it's got to be part of the thought process after things like Pittsburgh, right? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly with the with the rash of mass shootings we've had uh, recently, um, that sort of thing has been on people's minds. I mean, and just, you know, when we had the mass shooting in Texas, there were teachers outside the schools, there were police outside the schools. Right after the uh, Tree of Life shooting, there were, you know, were, that was in our state. So there were armed guards outside of our synagogue. It's not something that I would say is distracting. It's just something that you, you sort of have to do um, that, you, that unfortunately you have to think about. Um, but again, you know, that, that would plug into what I was saying earlier about how the fear is less of institutional stuff and more of a rogue agent. And it's, it's not surprising that this has popped up with some of these crazy conspiracy theories going on because, you know, eventually they will circle around to anti-Semitism. It's very easy. We're a very small minority. You're not talking about maybe two percent of the American population, and there are very easy tropes to fall back on. With you know, oh, Jews control the banks and all that sort of thing. Um, so it's it's a very uh, lazy hatred to fall back on for a lot of these extremists. So it's it's not surprising, but um, it's just something that you, that you have to you know sort of deal with. 
Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, Michael Siegel joining us. All right, that's the history and the cultural side of it. Unfortunately, we've got some real world examples, and it's not just internet people. Uh, it's people seeking office and two people that are actually heads of states of powerful countries. We're going to go through that. Michael Siegel joining us once again on Herd Tell. We'll continue right after this. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Dr. Michael Siegel, one of our favorites because he's on this program more than any other guest. Long may it continue, my friend, because you give good content, sir, among all your other great accomplishments in life. Joining us, he's a scientist, but we're talking a little more culture stuff today. Okay, we're talking anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, I wish this was all just a philosophical exercise, but it is not because we have real world people, one seeking power, two people that are heads of states that have issues in this regard. Let's start right in your backyard, Pennsylvania. Uh, Doug Mastriano is running for um, office there. He wants to be governor. He has gotten himself in some trouble with a financial backer from the guy that started up Gab. And I don't want to rehash this because we already talked about Gab before. Uh, Gab is a cesspool. It was purposely built to circumnavigate certain rules. So, and I'm not saying everybody on there does this, but this is what it was designed to do. Uh, it's so you can say stuff there that you can't say in regular polite society, including a lot of racist and anti-Semitic things. Uh, there's financial ties there. The founder, Andrew Torba, came out and made comments. Um, I don't want to take this out of context, so I will quote him. He basically came out and said, well, we don't give interviews to any reporters that aren't Christians, uh, meaning Jewish reporters. Uh, he said he was getting consulting fees yesterday. Mastriano came out and denied all this, said, no, he doesn't have anything to do with my campaign. I don't tolerate anti-Semitism. How does that's a lot to unpack, but this is not a new story. If you're taking money from somebody and they have bad ties, you can parse that part out in. How does this land for you? Because this is this is an election you have to vote in and that will affect you because you live in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I, I can't look into Mastriano's heart, so I don't know if he if he is anti-Semitic or not. I'd never heard anything particularly about that before this uh, scandal erupted. So I I have a tendency to give people a benefit of doubt, which maybe I shouldn't. But uh, I, I hesitate to accuse someone of anything. I do think that you are playing with fire when you associate with people like that. I mean, and, and it again doesn't have to just be anti-Semitism. It can be any sort of ism where people are saying racist things or homophobic things or anything like that when you associate with people like that when you take their coin that that affects you that affects how people perceive you and so i think the that um you know i'm glad he's you know said come out and said he's against anti-semitism i you know think that refusing this person's money would be uh, a little more uh, demonstrative we have seen politicians in the past return money from groups that uh, that didn't back that back them up that they thought were too extreme and and they didn't want to be associated with it. There's tons of money in politics, so there's not a, a shortage of places to get money from, especially when you're running for governor of a major state. Uh, I remember this came up a few years ago with the uh, Ron Paul campaign that there were you know stormfront people and other neo Nazis sort of backing him up, and uh, the response was, well, should we just give him you know we're taking away their money. Maybe we should, that's good to not have have the money. And I was like, no, you, you don't want to take these people's money. Um, the, the thing about anti-Semites and bigots in general with politics is they, I, I've described them as the barnacles of the political world. They have a tendency to glom onto anyone that they see as an outsider. You know, 10 years ago, it was Ron Paul, even though Ron Paul wanted to like, end the war on drugs and let lots of people out of prison, which you think the Nazis would be against, because he was perceived as an outsider and because they're always outsiders, they just glommed onto him. And then they sort of glommed onto Trump because he was an outsider. And now I think they're glomming onto, they might be glomming onto this campaign. I mean, it's just one guy, so we have to see what else is going on. But it's, I am hesitant to read into a politician's views and philosophy and 
character the views of the more extremist supporters, but I do think uh, a basic decency would require you to dissociate yourself from people like that. Is it the money or the rhetoric that bothers you more? And I know in politics, they kind of go together, but would, would some words and action be more meaningful here or is giving the money back more meaningful, do you think? I, I think that they're both important. I think you, you both have to say that this is unacceptable and you have to say, I don't want to be associated with that person. All right. Somebody who does have a tremendous amount of power, uh, Matriano just once said he doesn't have it yet. Uh, over in Russia, some really ugly stuff is going on. This is a little detailed. We'll link to it in the show notes. Folks can go in and read it for themselves. But basically, long story short, Vladimir Putin is threatening to shut down the Jewish agency in Russia. That is the agency that returned. Israel has a right of return. Anybody that has Jewish blood back to their grandparents has a right to citizenship in Israel. Something like a million people from Russia has gone to Israel. It's a huge part of Israel's original immigrant population. He's threatening to shut all this down now all of a sudden. There's geopolitical involved in this because Israel's been kind of a go-between during this Ukraine war crisis and a lot of other things. Russia's got a long history of this kind of stuff, and Vladimir Putin specifically has a bad history with certain groups. This is anti-Semitism on a global geopolitical level, yeah? Uh, yeah, but I also think it it's more related to Putin's sort of desperation and dementia with what's going on in the world. The, you know, he's got the West united against him. The war in the Ukraine has not gone as well as he wanted to. And especially at the hands of a Jewish president, I think that um, this is sort of him lashing out uh, in frustration uh, more more than anything else. I, I think the one thing, the only guide star that we are certain of with Vladimir Putin's philosophy is he favors Vladimir Putin, and he favors building Russia up to be more like the imperial Russia of the past, or that he imagines imperial Russia to have been in the past than it is now, and. I think any and every group is just someone he's willing to step on to get there. And so Jews are an easy target. Uh, and it also try, tries to keep Israel in line and other countries in line. But uh, I don't think it's necessarily indicative of a coming storm or anything like that. But you never know. I, I hesitate to look into someone with this disease of the mind as Vladimir Putin. Yeah, I don't blame you for that. Even if it's not directly relate at the Jewish community, though, when he does something like with Ukraine, where he starts in with the anti-Nazi stuff, which has all those overtones to go with it, that's still got to just land wrong, though, with the Jewish community, right? It, I, I mean, yes. I'm just normal people recoil at that. I imagine it's got to be specifically really perks up the ears of the Jewish community, like anti-Nazi, what are you doing? Yeah, and that's, again a lot more connected to internal politics of Russia that you have with Russia, this memory of the great patriotic war and the Nazis invading Russia and killing millions and millions of Russian people and so forth. So it's, it's, it's connected with that as much as it is anti-Semitism that this long history and their, you know, pride in winning the, the, you know, their part of world war two against uh, the, the Nazis. But yeah. And especially given what's going on in, Ukraine is basically an ethnic cleansing of Ukrainians. Uh, given the history of trying to ethnically cleanse uh, Ukrainians, Jewish or not, you know, I mean, Ukraine has always had a large Jewish population. But uh, I, you know, last year I read um, Ann Applebaum's fantastic book, Red Famine, about the Holod Holodomor. And, you know, I, I think that it's less connected with anti Semitism than it is, is on Putin trying to weaponize the rhetoric of the past, trying to otherize the Ukrainians, trying to justify. And we have over a million Ukrainians deported to Russia. We have children being torn away from families. This is absolutely an ethnic cleansing. And you don't have to necessarily be killing Jews to be in that, not, in that Nazi category. I think if you're ethnically cleansing a country, you're Nazi adjacent if you're not actually there. Separating um, countries and politics from stuff like this is hard. It doesn't get any harder than when it comes to the nation of Israel. Where do we, how do we parse that one out? Because the real bad faith actors that want to be anti-Semitic who cannot stand the Jewish people for whatever twisted reason they have, 
they love to work in that gray space of like, oh, we're not anti-Jewish, we're anti-Zionist. And then they start parsing that out. I know it's tough to delve into that, but that's just the reality we are in. What do you do with that? Because like you're saying with Russia, you know, Israel is also a country. Um, not everybody in Israel is a Jew. They have other minority groups as well. How do we handle that one without delving into those dark regions where those people start grabbing people and twisting their minds and twisting their words with it? Uh, it's it's tricky that you you have an Israeli government that has done things that a lot of people disagree with, uh, with, the, with the West Bank and so forth. Um, that I think even people who support the existence of Israel and the nation of Israel have problems with. And so you have a large middle ground and so forth. But it is, you know, what I like to say is that, you know, if you're anti the state of Israel, you're talking about dismantling the state that is the homeland to basically half of the Jews in the world and dismantling a state that has protected those people for, you know, almost going on 75 years now. And so it's one thing to oppose Israel's expansion of the West Bank. It's one thing to oppose how they're acting in, say, the Gaza Strip or something like that. But to you know, be against the existence or to have favor a one state solution, I think is is uh, I don't know if it's necessarily anti-Semitic, but you're you're talking about uh, a set of policies and a set of positions that is would many people would cons- be considered dangerous to the continued uh, survival of that state. I guess it's kind of like with Ukraine, where I'm like, yes, Ukraine has issues and they're not a perfect country either, but they don't deserve to be wiped off the map either. I yeah. think we can say the same with Israel. Like I can I can support Israel as a concept and as a friend and as an ally. I can condemn them when they do individual things wrong. You still don't get to wipe them out because of whatever problems they have as a country. That's that's way too far. And then we need to hash out the gray area. Is that the yeah, fair the problem, way to look at that? Yeah, the problem with if you if you're talking about, you know, if you disagree with what they're doing in the West Bank or Gaza, the problem is not the existence of the state of Israel. The problem is the people leading it right now. The people who are leading, although they just had a change in leadership, so that may that may change things. Um, but yeah, I think that's a perfect way of putting it, that we can be allies with country, we can support a country, we can support the existence of country while still disagreeing uh, with, uh, even though very vociferously with some of the policies they're engaged in. Yeah. Tough topic today. Really hard questions. You didn't duck any of them, even when I didn't ask them really particularly well. That's why, my friend, you still we need to get you one of the like wrestling belts, like most <laughs> most seen guests on the show. And you can have it over your shoulder every time you come out until somebody takes it from you. Uh, we'll look into doing that. It might have to be a screen graphic because we have no budget. Uh, Dr. Michael Siegel, you do wonderful work, sir. Um, on the road and appearing anywhere. Greatly appreciate that. Let folks know where they can follow you and what you have going on writing wise until they see you again. Uh, I'm I'm uh, away this week, but uh, nor- ordinarily I appear or at least once a week on Ordinary Times, Ordinary-Times.com. Uh, you can see how underscore RTFLC is where you can follow me on Twitter. You can also just go to YouTube and Google Mike's and check out Mike Siegel Astronomy, where I talk about uh, astronomy and movies, including uh, addressing your favorite movie of all time. Uh, so yeah, it's, I'm not difficult to find. Uh, Michael Siegel, appreciate you, my friend. Yeah. The, the YouTube channel is, that was an Armageddon dig. It's not my favorite movie of all time, but it's my favorite movie to throw at astronomers at all time because it just drives them crazy because of all the inaccuracies, but go watch the YouTube channel. It's fantastic stuff. You're a fantastic guest. You're an even better friend. Thank you for the time today, my friend. Oh, always glad to be on. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Talk again soon. Welcome back to Hertel. Okay, good friend of ours for a long time. Uh, Finally get to actually see what he looks like because I've never actually talked to him in person. One of the reasons I do this show, very important topic, though, uh, Dr. Ryan Townley. He's a clinician. Uh, He is an expert in Alzheimer's disease research. He's participated in research trials. He educates medical students. He answers my questions on direct messaging when I have really bad questions that need some expert opinion and guidance. Uh, You've written for us at Ordinary Times a couple different times. We're going to link to all your pieces you've written there. Uh, you're actually doing a conference right now. You never stop working on this stuff, do you, my friend? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Andrew. So 
Uh, yeah, it's first time uh, meeting and talking with you, so that's good. Yeah, I'm in the middle of the, it's called the uh, Alzheimer's Association International uh, Conference. So we, there are 5,000 uh, live neuroscientists from around the world that are studying Alzheimer's disease, uh, and then 5,000 joining uh, by by video. So yeah, we're in the middle. Uh, this is the last day, though, so. I got to imagine that they're probably talking about the same thing everybody else is talking about. Maybe they're not. You tell us. Um, there's been a lot of news headlines about Alzheimer's. There's been a lot of talk about misconduct. There's been talk about falsified data. Let, let's just cut right to this. This is a disease and a topic that scares people. It scares me. It takes a lot to scare me. This scares me. I've talked to you about this privately. I already have cognitive issues. This stuff scares people. When they see headlines that the research ain't good or they see headlines that, because we always want to think of drug trials as positive things, right? This freaks people out. Um, you've got a lot of experience in this. Turn down the noise for us. How big a problem is this? What is a problem? What isn't a problem? What would you tell the general public right now? Yeah, no, no, I think uh, it's it's very important to address that we haven't, ha there, there are so many sessions going on at once uh, in this conference. Um, there in the plenary sessions, kind of where everybody meets, it's been addressed. But uh, obviously, anything we say today and uh, and at the meeting, you know, there there is still that uh, innocent until proven guilty, right? But uh, you know, I, I think it's important to talk about what has been, what are these allegations, and how they sort of um, you know encompass the, the rest of the research uh, world. So. I would first point your audience, there's a really good website called alzforum.org. You can link that down too. Um, so, you know, what are experts in the field that research Alzheimer's disease saying? Uh, there's there's nice backgrounds of kind of what we'll be talking about today. And, you know, I think it's important too to sort of tease out uh, both of these stories independently. So I think the one that's been getting more press uh, is the one that, that from the science article uh, that we kind of talked about before we hopped on. But I'll, I'll first say, you know, there, there's another story under here that was actually being investigated first before they started to uncover this other story. So, um, you know, I, I think we can talk about both of those if, if, if you're interested. Yeah, start with the underlying because, you know, one of our key things on our program, we always talk about things don't happen in a vacuum, they happen in a sequence. So I think it's kind of important to show here that some of your folks, researchers like you, you kind of already had your antenna up on some of these issues anyway. You probably didn't know, hey, it was this bad or is going to be this much of a breaking news headline that it broke into general media. But you kind of had an inkling that there was some stuff not quite right for quite some time, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, you know, I, actually, the the one I'll start with, uh, just because it, it was a study I was following, I actually, you know, had a patient go into this study um, it, it's one from uh, Kosova Sciences. So that's a pharmaceutical company that um, has only been around for a couple of years, but they were publishing some really good phase two trial, which is where we start to see, hey, maybe this drug is working, but it's in like a small population. And uh, the, there, were, there were scientists that were raising red flags. They sort of said this data doesn't look quite right. Um, and uh, the FDA didn't put a halt on it. They moved forward with the phase three trial, which is kind of like our bigger trials. They were trying to enroll up to 1,750 people and uh, had about 120 enrolled so far. But basically, uh, some of those allegations are similar to this other story. There was concerns of data manipulation and fraud. And uh, it basically has led to multiple papers being retracted by journals from the lead scientists of this study. And just last week, so the, the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice opened a criminal investigation on, on the, um, the study going forward. So um, it's actually interesting background because the person that was hired to investigate this group, at, he started to dig a little bit further, right, uh, being, a, uh, being a good um, investigator. And he started to find some other uh, flagged papers, uh, some concerns from other scientists uh, um, and so the, then the second story, the one that was published last or I guess two weeks ago now in, in science, um, that's the one where we talk about uh, Dr. Uh, Sylvan uh, Lesney from the University of Minnesota. So I think that's the one that probably most of your listeners have heard of. Is that right? Yeah. And then this got into and I'm going to blow these pronunciations, but it started talking about the amyloid protein stuff. 
this turns out that it's a toxic protein. It's directly causing memory loss, which is, of course, the part of Alzheimer's that's so devastating for everybody on top of the other effects of it. So that's kind of the one that started getting mainstream attention because that kind of hits right to it's what we opened with. This scares people. That goes mm-hmm. right to the heart of the fear. So get us to the science of it before we get into the fear part of it and what this actually means with this doctor at the University of Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. So it was about 2006 when this um, this very large paper uh, was published in Nature, so a very prestigious journal. It's been one of the top four cited uh, articles over the last 20 years. Um I will say, so as somebody that is a clinician researcher, right, a, a lot of, you know, a lot of this, this science is in mouse research, right? So I'll get in trouble from our, uh, our basic scientists that work on this, but we have treated mouse timers a hundred times over, right? And it hasn't always translated to humans. So there's always skepticism with some of the mouse research, but there are big breakthroughs that still happen from, from animal models. And this was thought to be one of those. So, uh, this there's a there's a specific kind of like fragment of that amyloid protein you mentioned called E beta star 56. And that's essentially the toxic protein that was being sort of uh, charged with as you know, this this research was charging as as a as a culprit for memory loss uh, as direct memory loss, which was pretty new in the field. There was lots that have been working on amyloid toxicity, even these smaller fragments being toxic. Um, but this was one that was like, you know, there was catchy news articles that was like a beta star is born question mark. Um, and so so, you know, it, it was it was a pretty big deal. You know, we, but there was I, I would say, um, you know, that that these things, uh, you know, th- there are there are different tributaries of these research. Right. There was multiple other researchers working in this uh, field that were finding other toxic amyloid proteins. So it wasn't like this star, if you will, was the only one. Um, but it, it was obviously getting the biggest uh, biggest press at the time. And so, you know, this this uh, researcher, uh, what has been sort of the, the allegations here are that this individual was manipulating the images in a, or what we call figures in the research articles. So we won't go into the details of what exactly their, their Western blots is essentially what they were. But it was like he was basically manipulating the uh, the figure to make it look like this protein was being found. Um, and, and so like no one else within the lab and, and anyone else that has worked with him has been implicated, but he was the one that was making the figures at the end. Right. And, uh, um, and, and it, they found, so this, this uh, investigator found that 20 of his articles over the last, um, I guess, 15 plus years have been flagged by other researchers. And uh, they actually had independent, um, you know, forensic image consultants uh, also consult, and they all they all confirm these concerns that these images have been um, doctored or, or altered, if you will. Now, anytime uh, Dr. Ron Townley joining us, uh, people love their true crime shows. So you zoom in and then you get in the evidence and you start looking at the lab and you start looking at you can kind of lose perspective. So zoom us back out for just a second, because you get all these headlines like 15 years of Alzheimer's research is all worthless, that kind of stuff. Take, give us the 10,000 foot view, like you like to call it. How much of a problem is this? I know it's one researcher, but there is a lot of cross streams in research. Everybody's cross research and everybody's challenging. People that aren't used to the academic lingo, they don't know how those sort of things work. Give us kind of the big picture view, though, the grand scheme of things on this disease research and the ecosystem of trying to find a cure for this, which is what everybody wants. Where are we at and how big of a problem did this turn out to be? Yeah, no, I know. I think you're exactly right. And I, I do think that um, there are some sort of uh, overblown um, connections here in the science article. So and I, th- I think that has raised maybe a little bit more alarm than it should. So uh, as far as dialing down that noise, as you like to say, right, um, you know, this the idea that this has wasted, I think they mentioned like over five billion dollars of of research dollars into this idea um, this, this clearing amyloid idea, uh, you know, that certainly seems to be overloaded. uh, you know, with that 10,000 foot view though, it, this, these alleged acts, right. By any scientist, but particularly one that is heavily involved in the Alzheimer's field, uh, th- that's incredibly damaging to the overall scientific credibility, right. As you said, nothing happens in a vacuum. This, we're, the current environment that we're in 
is there's anti-vaccine groups, there's anti-climate change, there's anti-evolution groups. There's a lot of um, scientific skepticism, right, uh, within the world, particularly uh, as you look at some of the populism rising. And any misconduct such as this, a, a big misconduct here, um, you know, they're going to look to sink their teeth into that and they're going to look to to drive a wedge, right, um, with with any sort of, you know, disinformation is much easier when you've got clear examples to point to. It's almost like what we call bulletin board material, right, in the sports world. So um, in that larger scale sense, right, this is a really big deal. It's incredibly disappointing. It's troubling. Um, you know, we've also got the, so just in May, uh, uh, Dr. Lesne uh, got a big R01 grant from the NIH. So it's it's over $800,000. And so that's through the National Institutes of Aging. We're all pain for that, right? Um, so, uh, you know, and it's it's kind of like his career, at least what launched this big uh, grant for him, right, is, is supported on a breadcrumbs of, of falsified data. So that's, that's, that's where I sort of see the, the major issue. And I think many of us involved in this Alzheimer's research see it more of as a credibility to science in general, ra- rather than harming, um, you know, the specific, you know, mouse models or these, these Alzheimer's uh, models. So, you know, I think science does a pretty good job, at least compared to to most, as far as uh, sort of um, weeding out these bad actors. So he's currently under investigation by the university, the NIH, by all the journals that have been flagged with these uh, articles. But obviously, that's not a you know that's going to take some time. Um, and and you know, I think his credibility, at least for now, from what we know in the scientific community, is probably going to be gone. Right. So. We rely on, you know, our, our publications are the way scientists communicate with each other, right? And he's not um, able to uh, to publish things. Uh, that's going to make it a lot harder to to make a living in this in this field. So, you know, we do try to have mechanisms to weed out. Uh, you know, there's it, we're we're dealing with humans, right? So there's going to be bad actors in any uh, field. But I wouldn't. I guess that's the that's the main issue to me is we we can't all be lumped in with one individual, right? So. Um, the, the Alzheimer's disease research world as a whole, uh, you know, is, is very strong, but we have this one uh, weak link, right? Yeah. And, and then, then, yeah, go ahead. And and let's be adults here. The timing on this couldn't be any worse because we just spent two years arguing over COVID. And we learned even when they're trying really, really hard, the academic wing of science does not talk to the general public very well. The medical wing of science does not talk to the general public very well. The media doesn't do very good intermediating between either one of those parties. Even when you're trying hard, misinformation is just going to happen because, let's just be honest, research science speaks a different language than the general public. Research science speaks a different language than practicing medicine. It's two totally different things in a lot of ways. So even when you're really trying this stuff's hard, What's the remedy here? Is it going to be a criminal investigation? Is it going to be academically where they kind of tighten down how they do these trials? What do you think the fix in the near term is going to be here? Yeah, I think I think one of the the fallouts here, you know, any, you know, basically any article that gets published has figures or, or images, right, as part of it. So I think, uh, you know, it may be where there's going to be more of a surveillance system, right, of, of when, when articles are published that they have some of these data imaging uh, experts, you know, look for manipulation. I think that would be a reasonable step. But um, I think, you know, when we uh, when we think about, um, you know, the the research as a whole, especially when we think about Alzheimer's disease research, right? Uh, you know, there's there's multiple people that are that have tried to replicate this data. Right. So so that, that's why, you know, not myself in particular, but many that have been studying this amyloid toxicity, especially small fragments, uh, they've been kind of skeptical of, of that t- 2006 publication from the beginning because no one has been able to replicate it. And, and I think that's one of the big things that's, that's important in science is being able to replicate things. And, and I will say that you don't get much prestige for replicating uh, um, data, right, or, or studies. So I think there does need to be a larger push for um, you know, journals to be accepting these types of things. Not everything has to be shiny and new and novel, right? I think that's part of our culture in, in general. And that leads into the science world too, that, you know, it, even these studies that did show, hey, we couldn't replicate it, they didn't get published, right? So um, those those sort of negative rebuttals to, to sort of a large, uh, 
um, you know, paper like this, uh, that that needs to be something that changes as far as uh, uh, in the science world, right? Yeah, Dr. Ryan Talley joining us. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back. This isn't the first time we've talked to him. He's wrote about in Ordinary Times. We'll get a little bit of an update. The Biogen drug, a little bit of a controversy yeah, about a year and a half ago before all this. Get into that. And also some actual facts that folks need to know about this disease. Even with all the stuff we know now, there's still a lot of misperceptions about it. Folks are worried about it. Look, I'm one of them. I get scared talking about this stuff. Knowledge is a good remedy for fear. This is the guy to do it for us. Dr. Ron Talley is going to continue to join us on Herd Tell right after this. Welcome back to Hurt Tell. Dr. Ryan Townley joining us. Good friend of ours, a uh, good writer. He's written a few pieces for us over at Ordinary-Times.com. We're going to link to them. Going to update one of those pieces now. A while back, you were writing about um, the Biogen drug. Let's go back because you were talking about the percentage of Alzheimer's cases that deal with this amyloid. Do the nomenclature for me on amyloid, what it is, what it means, and how that got into the news cycle before this current crisis. Again, one of those things where you're saying, like, we know there's some problems in some of the research. Here's another case of it. But start with the nomenclature and then walk us up to it with the amyloids and what that means for this disease. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think uh, kind of looking back at the the larger scale view, uh, amyloid is a protein that it's actually highly uh, conserved in evolution. So it goes back, you know, basically to, to the beginning. Um, and so it's got an obvious role in the brain. Uh, so it's not something that we, that we, uh, you know, it's something that we need in there, but, um, the, the idea at least, uh, um, that amyloid is involved in this disease is, is a long history. So, uh, we've known for about 120 years, uh, that, that there are these plaques found in the brain of, of patients that have, uh, this Alzheimer's disease. And um, so even if you look back into the 1900s, when, when we were first looking at these things under the microscope, right, uh, these, uh, these proteins were, were there. And then, but we didn't really know exactly what was in the protein until all the way until 1984. So that's when we found that these plaques, these tangles of, uh, uh, of, uh, of this protein, it was, it was the amyloid protein. So it's only been, you know, that amount of time, about uh, we're getting near 40 years, uh, right, of, of knowing that. Um, these plaques, just to, to give your uh, audience some background, we, we assume uh, some things here, but we can find them in the cell initially. So they're clumping up within the cell. And if you think of the cell trying to send things everywhere, communicate with uh, other cells, right, um, when you get sort of like a traffic jam in there, right, with these plaques building up, then it's going to cause the cell to not work as efficiently, has to work harder, uses more energy. And um, as you sort of accumulate more and more of these, the cell can die, right? And then these plaques also form outside the cells. That's where we usually detect them in the brain. Um, but these cases, uh, all Alzheimer's disease cases have these plaques, right? So it's actually part of the definition of Alzheimer's disease is you have to have these plaques. Um, and... And so it really was in sort of the late 80s and 90s after this protein was found that we started to find some genes in, in sort of familial cases of Alzheimer's. So this is one of those things where if you have the gene, you're going to get the disease, right? Uh, those cases are actually quite rare. So it's only about 1% to 2% of Alzheimer's disease. Um, but and, and these are the cases that we call familial Alzheimer's. They usually affect people in their 40s and 50s. Um, and, and there's usually sort of that pattern of like dad side or mom side clearly has this uh, early onset pattern. Um, and so the, all three of the proteins that we have found to be a, you know, a cause of familial Alzheimer's involve this amyloid protein. Um, so that was sort of found in the, in that timeline. And then we've also got, uh, you know, in, in Down syndrome, we, we find one of those genes, there's like three copies of it. It's called the APP gene, which is amyloid precursor protein. So it basically is the thing that helps make the amyloid uh, and helps sort of uh, um, process it within the cells. And so, you know, what we've learned, especially as, as uh, care for patients with Down syndrome has improved over the last few decades, 
they're living longer and longer. And what we're finding is that many of them will have amyloid plaques in the brain by age 30 to 40. And if they live to 50, 60, the majority of them will get Alzheimer's disease. So all kind of those lines of evidence pointing towards amyloid at least being part of this process. Yeah, my mother was a special education teacher and specialized in Down syndrome children. So I'm really familiar with Down syndrome. And one of the things you ask her that she's proud of when she started teaching in the late 60s, when she retired in the early mid 2000s, the age of um, the life expectancy for Down syndrome went from 30 to 60. It's It's almost one for one now with a normal person that does not have Down syndrome. That's how far we've advanced. I find it fascinating. Science almost has a sense of humor sometimes that what we know is a developmental illness might solve one of our great end of life illnesses. Right. Okay, I'm not great at math, though, but you said that's one or two percent. That leaves ninety eight percent. So that's everybody else. All right. Scientist, doctor, we probably ought to deal with the ninety eight percent. What does it have to do with the ninety eight percent? What do we do with the vast the vast majority of people? Then, Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think. uh, that's honestly been a little bit of a divide in the field. So there are researchers that uh, that really do focus on these autosomal, autosomal dominant cases because we know if you have the gene, you're going to get the disease if you live long enough, right? So so there are you know great studies going on like uh, so Wash U in St. Louis, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. They have they're they're doing sort of a, a joint project with many other institutions where. They, they're literally following patients that have this gene and they're tracking biomarkers of amyloid and and we haven't talked about the protein tau, um, but they're doing all these scans and things and they're seeing changes in the brain, you know, 15 to 20 years before patients get symptoms, right? And uh, and so, but, but the folks that are studying this more of the 98%, right? They're finding those exact same changes, right? So we're seeing amyloid protein change 15 to 20 years before symptoms. And so there does seem to be this uh, Venn diagram overlap, right? Um, but obviously, we, don't, we, we haven't found a cause for those other 98%. So we typically call them sporadic. Uh, you know, we, we know that if they, they have this amyloid in the brain, they're at higher risk of developing, you know, dementia it, um, over a certain time frame. But uh, um, it, it sort of gets down to uh, what is the driver here of these cases, right? And there's, we, we do think that there's multiple things that lead into this, right? Age is probably the biggest risk factor, right? So we're, we're living longer and longer as a population and, uh, and therefore we're getting more cases of this disease. Um, we are finding, so one important thing for your audience, we're finding many modifiable risk factors, right? So um, there was a good Lancet article in 2020 that sort of looked at what are the big, uh, the big risk factors for developing dementia, associated with Alzheimer's disease. And they, they, they uh, suggested about 40%, right, uh, of the risk is attributable to these risk factors. So um, th- then what's the other 60% of that? Well, there is this genetic uh, risk factor allele called APOE4. So some in your audience may have seen this from a, you know, they might have gotten a, a 23andMe study, they might have gotten a um, heritage, uh, you know, genetic study. Um, this APOE4 allele is highly present in our population. So it kind of depends on which population you study, but on average, about 25% of the population has this gene. It's not like the other three genes we talked about, where if you have it, you're going to get the disease, but it is uh, a risk factor. So, um, you know, we, we find that um, having one gene, so you get a copy from mom, one from dad, if you have one, so maybe it's from mom or dad, uh, it increases your lifetime risk by about three times of, of developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then if you have two copies of so mom and dad both gave you a copy, then it increases your risk by 11 to 15 times. So that's exponentially higher. Um, but we're, we're seeing this APOE4 link with amyloid too. It's not clearing the protein out like it should. So again, at least one more sort of uh, line of evidence that amyloid is at least involved in the process, right? Yeah. Okay, a few minutes we have left. There's so much to this. We definitely need to get you back. Probably going to have to do a series of these if you're willing to do them so we can work through all this material. 
But the money question you always get, I'm sure you get it texted to you. Everybody you meet, as soon as they find out what you do for a living, probably ask you this. This is the question that's always on everybody's mind with this disease, though. Where are we at trying to get, we're probably not that close to a cure, but at least some kind of a treatment, because unfortunately, there's just not a whole lot they can do with this illness right now. You already hinted at some of the lifestyle stuff we're starting to look into as factors. Treatments, cures, drugs, where are we at? Do we have hope on the horizon? Just give some people some good data because they don't ever want to get took in with miracle drugs because there's not one of those coming for something like this. But there is some positive stuff, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think there there's a couple of positive things that, that we can finish with. So um, I think one is we're getting better and better about detecting this earlier, right? So as a memory... Um, clinic specialist, when I'm seeing patients, it's often after something is very obvious, right? In that sort of stage of severity that we call dementia, when it's starting to actually interfere with day-to-day life. And so we're getting biomarkers on the horizon. There's lots of data. So, so I saw many presentations this, uh, this past week on blood biomarkers, right? So this is the, the you know, you don't need to do a $14,000 scan or or, you know, check spinal fluid, right? You can detect these protein changes in the blood. Um, the main things that are preventing this from happening tomorrow is uh, is we just got to kind of work out the kinks of patients that have kidney disease, sort of a more diverse population than our research population validating these things, right? So uh, so I think detection, right, is going to be one big thing because we need to catch this earlier and earlier so then we can test our theories of different drug trials and things before uh, there's been, you know, brain cells that have been uh, uh, lost worldwide or, you know, throughout the throughout the brain. So I think that's one thing. I think the, uh, you know, we've seen a large amount of funding increase in Alzheimer's disease here in the last really 15 years. So if you look even back to, uh, you know, about um, 2010, only about 400 million uh, of our of our uh, budget was was allocated to Alzheimer's disease uh, research, and that has exponentially grown. So we're now it was announced uh, in May that it's going to be three point five billion this year, right? So we're getting a lot more push and funding uh, for research, which um, you know three point five billion sounds like a lot, right? But that's this disease costs our healthcare system three hundred twenty one billion per year, right? So that's a drop in the bucket to what this actually costs let alone the the stress, right, that happens for families and caregivers uh, of this disease. So um, I think part of this, our acceleration of knowledge is being driven by, uh, you know, this large push for funding. And we've got lots more people in the field uh, pouring our energy into research. Th- there's this really interesting sort of parallel to cardiovascular disease, right? So um, when you look back at this sort of trend line, um, in the 1960s and 70s, we didn't know exactly what caused heart disease, but we started to find these risk factors similar to what we're finding now in Alzheimer's. And a lot of advancements in technology and treatments um, have have seen from 1968 to kind of the last five years, the, the drop in mortality from a heart attack is about 70%, right? Uh, and it still accounts for one in five deaths, um, but it's a, it's a massive drop. Uh, uh, in achievement. And we're kind of seeing this parallel. Where are we at in Alzheimer's world, right? We're, we're about in the 1960s and 70s, right? So, so there's, there, we're starting to actually see a slight decline in the uh, incidence of Alzheimer's. So I should explain that briefly, because um, you're going to say, uh, we, er, there's a lot more people getting it, right? And, and so that's really the prevalence, right? So the, the idea that, um, because we're living longer, we've got a lot more folks getting Alzheimer's disease. But if you look at like somebody that lives to age 90 now versus in the 1980s versus the 1960s versus the 1940s, obviously there's less of them in those decades, but those folks were at higher rates of, of getting dementia actually. So I think we're seeing some decline in Here's what I found. The, the people that are, you know, getting dementia in their 80s uh, because of a lot of these cardiovascular risk factors that we're, we're pushing, right? So um, it, it kind of, to finish, what are, what are some of those things your audience can be working on, right? So these lifestyle things, a lot of them are cardiovascular. What's good for the heart is good for the brain is what we always say, right? And so, you know, when you think of what are those risk factors, high blood pressure. Uh, high blood pressure in midlife has 
uh, increased incidence of dementia later on. So detecting, treating high blood pressure, detecting, treating high cholesterol, diabetes, sleep apnea. These are all big vascular risk factors, which also damage the brain. Um, And then when we look at sort of these other modifiable ones, so I just mentioned sleep apnea, but just quantity of sleep is important too. You know, about seven to eight hours is recommended. Um, Educational attainment, you know, we talk about the brain almost like a use it or lose it type of thing, right? So um, lifelong learning is important. If you've got a, we've all seen this, right? If somebody retires and they got all these hobbies they want to do, they've got traveling they want to do, they're, they're incorporating all these novel things in their life. That's a much different retire, retirement than somebody that kind of starts passively picking in TV, right? And so using your brain, staying active is important. Physical exercise is by far the most important thing you can be doing for your brain. So we recommend about, the, the National Institutes of Aging recommends about 150 minutes a week. And uh, that's like moderate, at least moderate exercise, getting a sweat going, right? These are all, those are all important for the brain too. And then Lastly, there's diet. Uh, um, I think there's a lot of interesting research on this. We, we recommend the Mediterranean diet right now that has the best evidence, uh, but certainly things that are low in carbs and sugar seems to be uh, better for the brain. And there's even some really interesting research going into ketones and the ketogenic diet that, uh, that I, I, I'm excited about. So a lot of things that we're looking forward to, right? And I, th- I think that we can certainly reduce the risk by modifying these things even earlier on. Yeah, Dr. Ryan Townley, this has been fantastic. We'll, we'll do it again real soon. We'll have you back. Till we get you back on the program, though, we're going to link to a lot of stuff from this conversation. Please read this stuff yourself. Good links you can stick on social media when people are losing their minds or sending out bad links. We're going to give you some good stuff to add on there instead. Let folks know where they can follow you, your social media. Uh, you're doing good work in this field. You also do great work on your Blackstone Grill as a Twitter Supper Club member in good standing. Uh, let folks know where they can follow you until they see it again on the yeah, so I think the only platform I'm really active in is is on Twitter, and uh, I it's uh, at Dr. T from KC, uh, so you can find me on there. And then we actually, you can find, we can link some uh, of our YouTube. I give actually a lot of talks to primary care providers on some of some of these diseases, and um, so those, those are on our YouTube links as well. Yeah, we'll link to all that stuff. Good doctor, good work, great stuff, good information. Appreciate your time today. Thank you for squeezing us in among meetings, sir. All right. Thank you. It's good good to meet you, Andrew. Good to see you. Okay, one of our favorites. We love working with her off camera. We love getting her on camera and getting to chat with her because she does so much stuff. I can't even tell you how busy this person has been the last few weeks. Gabriella Hoffman is back on the program, even though you're on the road right now, aren't you? I am. I am finding myself on the road. I'm trying to wind down my travel. Uh, that's that's a problem I have, but it's it's all good. And I'm enjoying it. I'm as I was telling you before going on the air. I am in Colorado for the first time, which people find and are in disbelief over because I travel out west a lot. But no, really excited to talk to you from Colorado, Colorado Springs more specifically. So we have a lot to break down. I'm excited to break down things with you. Proud home of the Air Force Academy, among other many, many beautiful things. Be careful walking around that <laughs> altitude will sneak up on you. Uh, beautiful. That's the type of <laughs> yeah. No joke. That, hey, look, I'm an, and I am a mountain kid, but the two, 3,000 feet of the Appalachians ain't the Rockies. It sneaks up on you. No. Um, let's start here because I'm, there's so much to cover, and you've been doing conferences and media appearances. Let's start a little big picture and then zoom back in because you were tweeting about something, and I read it last night because it popped up on my feed. Um, the AP style book. We've been talking about guns in our country. We we had some gun legislation passed that was we can dig into it in a little bit, but it was it was a lot of rearranging nomenclature without doing a whole lot. But we can talk about that later. But they want to do the assault weapons ban again. It is one of Joe Biden's signature accomplishments in his entire career, the 94 signature assault weapons ban. So it makes sense. They're pushing again, even though it's not going to go anywhere. There's a committee uh, hearings about it right now. But you brought up the AP style book that they have a definition of assault weapons. And of course, our Second Amendment friends are always like, well, assault weapons, what does that mean? Because that's just a word. 
Talk about that for a second, why that caught your attention, because it sure caught mine. Yes. So a common refrain we hear from people who dislike modern sporting rifles or they dislike AR-15s is they label it using the nomenclature, it's an assault rifle. And as someone who has spent some time around these weapons in question or these rifles in question, I don't see how you can label it as such, even with having some recreational shooting experience. I'm not military. I'm a civilian and all that. But having spent quantifiable time around these rifles in question, I don't see how they're assault in nature. Uh, You look at how the firearm is crafted, how it's manufactured, and you especially look at the trigger guard, the triggers especially. And when a scary looking rifle has even just one pull of the trigger corresponding to one bullet coming out, that's not assault in nature. That is a semi-automatic firearm in nature. And the Associated Press Style Guide, thankfully, has put out a wonderful graphic, and I think they have a full explainer saying that, hey, fellow media members, you guys not need to be tasked with accuracy and reporting because you can't go around using this pejorative term, an assault rifle, to label modern sporting rifles that are owned largely safely by 24 plus million people, according to new statistics that are out by the National Shooting Sports Foundation. So media organizations still peddle in this false labeling of a modern sporting rifle as an assault rifle, when in fact it is not when you look at it and examine it, mechanically speaking, and kind of just how the trigger guard is oriented. So I wanted to highlight that on Twitter. I found that to be interesting. I was like, I got to find that graphic because it does tie into, I think today they're going to be questioning manufacturers in Congress to hold them culpable for mass shootings, which they don't have any culpability with because their products are not geared towards and marketed towards criminal usage. You talk to any one of them. I understand they want to go there to probably clear the record. And then we could talk about the immunity law, the PLCCA, if you want to dive deep into it as well, which actually does not offer full immunity to them. So that's kind of the wraparound for the graphic because it ties into that hearing that is occurring today with manufacturers because they want to hold them up as these horrible merchants who are peddling in death when in fact the opposite is true. I've been to SHOT Show. I've never felt unsafe going to SHOT Show where manufacturers gather. They like to see their products used safely. And so I hope they do clear the air if those that are testifying go there to do it and not get suckered into kind of the Democrat anti-gun talking points. I think they're going to go there to clarify and say like, hey, we're in compliance. We're not fully immune given different uh, statutes within immunity in the PLCCA that law that's in the books that actually got a lot of bipartisan support when it was passed into law in the early 2000s. A lot of Democrats actually signed in, the the moderate Democrats that used to be there signed into that. So that's kind of a wraparound into that graphic and just the common mistake or deliberate intention of labeling modern sporting rifles, oftentimes Air 15 or Armalite Rifle 15s in this light. So that I hope your listeners kind of understood that with kind of my big picture wraparound with it. Yeah. And the reason I want to get into this, and this is a little in the weeds, but you got to get in the weeds on this for a reason. They say, well, we want an assault weapons ban. We had one for 10 years, 94 to 2004. We had an assault weapons ban. The problem is you cannot just pass a law and say we ban all assault rifles. If you said and you wrote a piece of legislation that was one line that said we ban assault weapons, that would ban nothing because there's no such thing as an assault weapon. I understand the term. I know people apply it, but the black and white of the law, that wouldn't apply to anything. They have to go in and they have to do, especially with weapons, things like this, they have to do very specific nomenclature. And the reason this is a big deal, and we've seen it to the ridiculous point, because we all remember when chainsaw bayonet was a thing a couple of years ago because somebody got suckered on that. They start talking about the parts of the weapon. So are you going to talk about the parts of the weapon that matter? The receiving, the rate of fire, has it been modified? One thing I think you could find some common ground on, are you modifying it from the manufacturer's uh, designations, which is something they're going to be talking about in this committee hearing today? Or are you going to deal with things like, does the stock slide? Is it black? Is it scary looking? Does it have you know, 30 rounds instead of a 20 round magazine, you know, these things that matter less than that. I know mm-hmm. people are going to go to things like Uvalde in the school shootings and go, well, the police were out gun, which they weren't, but we'll talk about that some other time. This legislation though, 
is it going to be foolishness where you go into what it looks like, or are you going to actually deal with the nomenclature of what the weapon is designed to do? Because I know which way it normally goes over the last 10, 15 years that I've been watching them do this, and they don't go to the serious part of it. Mm-mm. No, for them, they've revealed their intentions. They do want to have a wholesale ban of anything they don't like or anything they ascribe negative qualities to with respect, especially to the Air 15, some of which have been used in recent mass shootings, but they are not the dominant firearm often used by criminals to commit these ghastly acts. Those are handguns, but that's still no justification to ban them. But I think we've seen them reveal what their intentions are. They will say, okay. We'll just examine some of the physical attributes of an AR-15 or a mar- modern sporting rifle. But when you when they're probed and let's say the eyewitnesses will respond back to them and maybe school them perhaps about educating them on the different features, I think they'll reveal their true intentions. And they already have. They have said, we just want to start here and then we will expand to banning every gun we possibly can. And I understand They say, well, this is a common talking point to refute gun control arguments that they want to eventually go after everything. But it's an incremental it's kind of like an incrementalist ban style to slowly but surely go after, let's say, perceived scary looking guns, so-called perceived assault rifles, which are not assault rifles in nature. And then they're going to work their way up when they can, let's say, sucker in Republicans, too, because there are a few Republicans who pretend to be for the Second Amendment who are starting to buy this. But there are a small number of few and far between, but a handful in the House do sometimes join Democrats to do this. I think Adam Kinzinger has expressed interest in doing this as well. And I think Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania is also in that uh, group of Republicans that are very wobbly on firearms when it comes to these more detailed kind of um, more thought provoking firearms that deserve to have more, let's say, attention awarded to them, given the unique features they have. Uh, because you can't just say it's an assault weapon or uh, assault rifle here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so I think they want to use this to paint these firearms in a negative light. They're going to then try to lambast these manufacturers and say, well, your products are responsible for killing kids in school. How do you respond to this? Don't you feel guilty? So they're going to make them feel guilty for they directly not having any involvement in these horrific mass shootings, saying your product is creating a culture of killing. How do you feel about this? So they're going to try to turn the public against these manufacturers and not really give the manufacturers time to respond. And maybe some manufacturers will be able to overcome these really ridiculous questions that are expected to be wielded towards them, awarded to them. And like I said, I think it goes back to they're going to start here. If they can successfully ban an AR-15, put it under the NFA, uh, make it harder for people to obtain them, although there is a genuine market demand for them. Like I had alluded to er earlier, the growth in ownership of AR-15s is not an accident. It's not some conspiracy to see criminals doing it. It's not some, it's not creating a more criminal class. It's a lot of people who are buying this. So it's not some outlier purchasing behavior that we're seeing going on, but they want to make it into like a boogeyman that, oh my God, these rifles are proliferating. This is what's happening. If we don't regulate it, it's going to lead to more bloodshed. But like I had said earlier as well, Air 15s are not as commonly used in mass shootings as, let's say, handguns are, or let's say crimes involving firearms more so. So it's really hard to regulate and pinpoint a rifle, but you can easily discriminate against it because it aesthetically looks very scary. So I worry that they're going to use this example. Let's say if they succeed in doing this, I don't see them doing this in the Senate, even with a more divided makeup there. Um, the House, we may see some iteration of this pass, but you go even into states that have, let's say in Virginia, they tried to pass this when Democrats were in control of our General Assembly. They couldn't even get Democrat support because they knew there would be huge blowback to banning modern sporting rifles. So I can see that similarly play out in that in the Senate. I don't know about in the House, um, even though the facts presented showcase that this is a very commonly owned firearm. It's used in defensive gun usage. Um, It's very popular among women. It's very popular among minority gun owners. And so for them, I think it's just a stepping stone to eliminate all guns from society. But they want to use this as a first example to then say, okay, we're going to eventually ban, let's say maybe an extended magazine, or maybe we're going to ban do-it-yourself guns, um, even though they may be ATF compliant and they have a serialized number. We'll ban ghost gun kits, although there is legal precedent and judicial precedent to not do it because Nevada just actually overturned their so-called ghost gun ban kit. 
citing First Amendment and also Commerce Clause concerns about doing that. Um, I think it's just an incrementalist way for them to get to the public, to pull up the heartstrings and then proceed full speed ahead. And like you said earlier, with Republicans signing on to this gun control piece of legislation, which sounds great with respect to nomenclature, but it's not really going to have an effect on mitigating crime. I think if they're able to capture Republican support for this, they're going to, again, then you can get wholesale gun control. But maybe there's still an appetite to say, whoops, we're not going to support this. This is above the pale for us. This is not going to please the public. It really has no effect on crime and mitigating instances of crime. And you may even get some Democrats. I think a few that are in swing districts that are very competitive this year. I think in Maine, there's a competitive district where a former Marine who is the Democrat incumbent is pretty vulnerable. And I think he has voted against some of the gun control measures recently, citing where he lives and how Maine is very rural and it wouldn't be the will of the people in his district to do so. But yeah, I think it could open the door to future gun control, confiscatory measures. And they've been going about this for many years. In terms of me observing it, I've seen them do this back and forth since Obama's time. So this is nothing new. And if they are to succeed in the messaging war with kind of painting these firearms in a negative light, what's to stop them from banning handguns? Because those are the most used in crime uh, when criminals are using guns for enacting really horrific acts. So I don't think they stop here. They'll continue. course their argument is going to be to turn around and go well of course we want to ban handguns we get rid of all the guns there won't be any violence you just went through the legislative and the political arguments of this but that's only two parts of it the other part of this is the legal part of this argument assault weapons ban was never directly challenged in court on the second amendment grounds now since then there's two things that have happened we've had heller the heller decision which is probably going to be precedent going forward it's already been cited in fact it was cited in one of the cases you just mentioned And we have a conservative Supreme Court that we've seen that's, you know, (laughs) you might have heard kind of overturning things as of late. If they tried to do another one of these bans, and we've already seen some other things going, what's the legal environment now post Heller with a conservative court, at least for the foreseeable future for guns rights legislation and gun control legislation as well? I think the Roberts court is structured in a way where see more. I think overturning of gun control legislation, at least the most egregious parts of it. I'm not sure if we're going to see them say you have to eliminate the permitting system for concealed carry. I'm not sure they're at that point quite yet, although there could be some casework that does build up for them to say, okay, the permitting system is restrictive. It does infringe on your Second Amendment rights. And we're seeing the states do that. 25 states now, half of the country has constitutional carry. But the the Bruin decision opens the door to a lot of different things. I think good things Um, in the outstanding states that had shall issue regimes, uh, permitting regimes. You now start to see most of these states, with the exception of New York, for the most part, complying with the ruling, adjusting their permitting system to reflect the Supreme Court decision. I think some of them are still going to create obstacles. They're going to find some way to to retool the permitting system. Well, okay, we're going to give would be applicants a bone and we're going to, you know, make it a little easier. But I think in some of the states I I can envision in, let's say New England, it'll still be fairly difficult. I think it'll be easier in Massachusetts than let's say New York to obtain a concealed carry permit. Now, Um, Rhode Island may similarly have some obstacles. I think um, some of the other states too, Delaware has a weird permitting regime where you have to get your name published in the newspaper before you can successfully obtain a permit. I thought found that to be super crazy and invasive. But I think um, with this decision handed down, because the Roberts court found that creating these obstacles to obtaining a permit restricts your ability to protect yourself outside the home. So they, I think they went off of the Heller decision to say, okay, if we ruled that you can safely and legally own a home inside your house. Okay, now we have to rectify the problem of can we allow people to own handguns This doesn't apply to long guns, uh, open carry, although that's a separate debate, of course. But can we apply a similar standard to handguns 
outside your home? Can you carry outside your home? And so they found good arguments. I know Justice Thomas wrote the majority opinion of this and said that it would be ridiculous to keep the standards in place. And it was time to overturn these may issue permitting rules. And so um, there is an appetite. It also reflects kind of the times we're in. More and more people are obtaining concealed carry permits. And like I said, some states are even going beyond that and adopting constitutional carry measures, which still don't really change anything that much. You can't be a prohibited possessor. You can't have a criminal record. And it only applies to handguns. Again, not to rifles or any long guns in that sense. And so I think when people see that they can't count on law enforcement, they can't count on people who are supposed to, you know, observe their safety or rather secure their safety, um, whether it was in the 2020 kind of riots or let's say um, distrust in law enforcement that you can kind of see in some areas of the country. Let's say that you've followed up from the Uvalde shooting. I think no matter where you fall on the gun issue, I saw almost uniformity when it came to the lack of preparedness that those law enforcement officers have. And that's not to say every law enforcement officer is poorly equipped to respond to a mass shooting, but these guys in particular were very, very poorly equipped to do it. And it's not because of them having guns. It's just they didn't want to go in and do it for some strange odd reason. People see these different factors. You can't count on your government officials to protect you. You can't count on law enforcement. And you have vigilantes who are enacting harm all over the place in major cities and now even in rural areas. You start to see crime going up in rural and suburban areas too. So no place is immune from the surge in crime that we're seeing. So Americans want to take it upon themselves to get a handgun. They perhaps want to learn how to use it. They want to get a permit to be able to safely carry outside their home. And so you see changing opinions. I have cited two recent polls. I think it was a Marquette Law School poll and a Reuters Ipsos poll that showed that there is pretty overwhelming support now for concealed carry outside the home. Although the methodology for the other questions about gun ownership was very weird in my opinion, but it showed over 60% of support for concealed carry. So the Supreme Court is reflecting where public opinion is going on concealed carry. And I think more and more trends will follow that. And I think this court will hear more cases because I, like I said, I still think some of these formerly may issue states are going to create obstacles. New York city is one example, or New York is one example. And, and New York city, the fact that they're not wanting to, basically there's really no change to the concealed carry regime there. They're still restricting it from private businesses. It's not just public spaces or government buildings or public sector type um, buildings, you know, government offices, things of that sort. Now they're, they're keeping restrictions in largely public places, um, which would otherwise comply with the Supreme Court and put shall issue there unless otherwise posted. Um, but they're still creating a lot of obstacles. So I could see New York <clears throat> failing to comply with Bruin decision being further challenged and maybe prohibitions to other aspects, um, maybe challenges to the suppressor laws um, and other tools that are so shown to enhance your experience and not contribute to crime rates in this country uh, being challenged in the court of law because this has created an opening. So I think for gun rights supporters, you can be very optimistic. They're not going to overturn all gun control legislation at this point in time, but I think they're going to be open to challenging a lot of really nonsensical laws that have kept a good portion of the country from enjoying their ability to conceal carry in public safely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Talking to Gabriella Hoffman fighting through a cold. She's playing hurt, but she's getting it done for us. We're going to take a quick break. Let her get a drink. Uh, when we come back, we're going to continue to talk about 2A. Uh, one of the things that's always thrown out at 2A folks is, well, you can still hunt and stuff. Well, she's a conservation expert. We're going to talk about the hunting because there's been a lot of regulation in that area. It all ties together. We're going to continue our conversation. Gabriella Hoffman, one of our <clears throat> favorites on Herd Tell right after this. Welcome back to her tell Gabriella Hoffman. She is a great person to work with behind the scenes, really enjoying because she's one of these regional manager. 
uh, one of our great contributors with Young Voices. She is all over the place, though. Got a long list of her. Here's where I want to go with this, because we're talking Second Amendment a little bit in depth today. Uh, people talk about it. It's like, well, you should be hunting and nothing else with it. Here's the problem with that, because I grew up rurally. I grew up in West Virginia, big hunting state. Uh, we have enough weapons in West Virginia probably to outfit a small army just in private possession. Here's the problem. Hunting rights and sportsman rights have been under assault, much quieter than Second Amendment. Some of the bigger things that people focus on, because that makes a lot more money. Let's just call it what it is. It gets more fundraising. Conservationists and sports rights, whether it's hunting, fishing, just good old fashioned property rights and land use rights. You've been writing a lot about this. This really is the other side of the coin when we talk about the Second Amendment, though, because on one hand, folks are saying, well, it's for hunting and that sort of thing. Those rights have been trying to be restricted at the same time. It makes that argument a little disingenuous to me. What do you think? I think you're probably alluding to probably my coverage of the Return Act. And we could talk about that legislation, too, and whether or not it is an infringement on the Second Amendment, as some Republicans are arguing. But the only connection really you could make between the Second Amendment being the guarantee of hunting rights, which it really isn't. There's no language associated with it in the 27 words pertaining to the Second Amendment. But the only connection you could really find is the funding mechanism that connects the two activities together. And that is a self-imposed excise tax that manufacturers and other sportsmen and conservationists wanted to see self-imposed in the 1930s through the Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937. And they recognized that if they were extirpating commonly owned or commonly known species rather, from the landscape that there would be a lot of turmoil in the future. And so you have now today over $15 billion that has been generated to go back to the States. This year alone, it was, they say it's between 1.1 and $1.5 billion that has been returned to the States to help with target shooting ranges on public land, assisting with um, hunters education courses, wildlife conservation, habitat restoration efforts. And there's really no disagreement between manufacturers in the firearms industry and sportsmen to have this channel of funding that goes to all these activities. Now, with respect to the Return Act, the proponents of that, one individual in particular, Andrew Clyde, and he campaigned on this actually when he was running for Congress. He's an FFL dealer, and he sees any imposition of an excise tax as your infringement to keep and bear arms. But you talk to most people who are Second Amendment supporters who also happen to go hunting, you don't hear a uniform support for his proposal. And what he wants to do is he wants to eliminate Pittman-Robertson funds. He claims it's unconstitutional. I've never seen that argument ever played out. And he claims, well, the Supreme Court is going to rule on this and they're going to eventually make their way to, to say that this law is unconstitutional and we have to get with the program. And when I explore excise taxes, the only connection, like I said, that that connects hunting with the Second Amendment, your purchasing of guns and ammunition. Um, I haven't seen any argument say that you're going to lose your gun rights. You're going to lose your ability to own guns. And when some some of my friends have pressed this congressman about the Return Act, OK, show us where exactly the infringement occurs. Show us where downstream it hits consumers. And I haven't seen any evidence. I've been asking people in the industry. I've asked, I've tried to do my own research. I looked at Tax Foundation. I looked at all these different things. I even looked at the Rand Corporation, where the other side, you have Democrats, anti gunners. We have Congressman Don Beyer, who wants to oppose a thousand percent excise tax on modern sporting rifles to discourage purchasing power and purchasing behavior of people to buy this. I think both proposals are wrongheaded. Um, and when it comes to this proposal for the Return Act, you're not really seeing a decrease in cost when you eliminate an excise taxes. Excise tax is formulated very differently from the sales tax. You're not going to see on your receipt, okay, this is what you saved with the absence of Pittman-Robertson. And so he also claims that it's going to be a replacement fund with 800000 or $800 million to go to conservation funding to substitute Pittman-Robertson funds that are generated and that's like a loss of if we go with the the least amount, the 1.1 billion, that's a loss of 300 million dollars. If you go to the 1.5 billion mark, that's a loss of 700 million dollars. And you see a lot of sportsmen and women who are also are proponents of the Second Amendment. You you see them 
say that, hey, this is not the battle to be fighting. This is not <clears throat> where we see attacks on your ability to own and keep arms. We impose this on ourselves. This is a way to check ourselves so we don't wreck ourselves when it comes to wildlife conservation. And also another component I alluded to, like I said, you eliminate Pittman Robertson funds, people are not going to be able to enjoy recreational shooting on public target ranges. It's very expensive right now, by all estimates, to go to a private range. And private ranges are great. I've done most of my shooting at private ranges. But it's an attack on the Second Amendment if you want to make that argument. If you're not going to have funding for these public ranges, and th during the Trump administration, they actually passed a bill to enhance it, so more Pittman-Robertson dollars do go to target ranges, and that was passed almost with pretty big bipartisan support a few years ago. And so the way Pittman-Robertson is structured, again, it's a self-imposed tax, and then you also have this component where you are seeing funding going to target ranges. I think it's a lost battle. You shouldn't be dividing sportsmen and women who do support the Second Amendment in this light, and I think Republicans are going to have to answer for this if they claim we're sportsmen and women. And then people will see that, well, your name was attached to this very successful conservation law. So how can I trust you to defend my ability to go hunting, fishing, and even to protect my ability to practice target shooting on public ranges? So it, it, it's not really seen as an infringement on Second Amendment rights. And you see most of the gun manufacturers support Pim and Robertson funding. So that's the that's the unanswered question there. If, if they're in support of this, they don't see this as an infringement on Second Amendment rights. Why is this battle being waged? What is this sponsor of the bill gaining out of this? And, and how can you justify replacement with this program when you're going to see a net loss and you're going to see conservation funding altered severely? And again, your ability to do target ranges. Those are going to those are going to have to be closed if there's no funding to supply those target ranges or to maintain them rather. And so it's just it's it's not going to pass anywhere. I've heard from people inside Congress who said this bill is laughable. It'll never be heard when Republicans if Republicans take over. It's a losing issue. It causes division. It's not the battle to wage against gun control. Fighting against the attempts to ban AR-15s and other measures that are actual gun control items are more fruitful rather than creating a boogeyman out of the Pittman-Robertson Act. Yeah, real quick, a couple <laughs> minutes we got left. Gabrielle Huffman joining us. Love having her. Here, here's something that I think we lose because we get into the Second Amendment debate and there's the nomenclature like we started out talking about. Really, though, when you break this all down, we're talking about rights. And like you just, everything you just talked about in there, property rights, what the government can and can't tax, Second Amendment, First Amendment speech. This is the core stuff. If you go back and read, this is what they debated over the Constitution. This is what they debated over the bill. This is really just foundational stuff. It's just you put the guns on top of it. People kind of lose their minds a little bit. But it's the same. Whatever other issue you're going to talk about, it all goes back to those fundamental rights, doesn't it? It does. And often I hear from my dad tell me that what separates us from, let's say, the Soviet Union or formerly uh, communist countries or countries that are experiencing bouts of tyrannical you know, tendencies is the Second Amendment. Countries that are more free tend to have this measure in place. Everyone says, well, crime is a lot higher in the United States with the presence of lawful gun ownership, but that's actually not the case. I think the United States only accounts for 4% of violent crime all across the board. Someone, I forget his affiliation, but he was tied to one of the gun organizations. I think he's a lawyer, but he's a statistician as well, or he knows how to extrapolate data fairly coherently. And he found that actually we don't account for the most violent crime across the globe. Other countries, often with the absence of firearms, lawful firearms ownership, tend to be more violently aggressive than the United States. And so people forget that, oh, my gosh, there's a proliferation of guns. This is horrible to have. But we're a lot safer with the presence of an armed citizenry that is safely trained, that is educated. And more and more people are getting into the fold. They want to be trained. They want to know how to use their guns. We're a lot safer and we can repel, let's say, instances of tyranny, whether it comes from attackers coming into your home or people who want to regulate guns out of existence. Not saying you discharge any violent tendencies towards political opponents, but I'm saying rhetorically speaking, item legislation, whatever, uh, because of the Second Amendment and just case study. And like I said, Supreme Court rulings and other other. Uh, measures out there that say that regulating this is going to be seen as an infringement on rights. The public is moving in the direction towards support of the Second Amendment and away from gun control, no matter how present, let's say, the mass shootings, 
Um, people see, again, that the criminals, people see that the criminals who often are committing the crimes, whether it's an AR-15 or a handgun, they're often prohibited possessors, the repeat offenders. So banning a gun is not going to deter someone who has a track record of already committing criminal behavior with the use of firearms. It's not going to change if you eliminate the firearms. Prohibitions usually never work. And so I think people go back to it's a fundamental right. It's enshrined in the Constitution. More and more people are learning how to use firearms safely and responsibly. And they see that without it, it can lead to instances of tyranny. It can lead to a lot of people being vulnerable to attack. And so that is why support for it, why we're going to see lots and lots of fighting back, I guess, to the gun control start to be witnessed even more. Like I said, public opinion is moving in, it, in this direction. I think with education, people will see it. And you start to see media organizations like the AP even saying, let's be accurate in our reporting because this can give ammunition to bad actors to misrepresent what is being discussed. So I'm optimistic. I want to be optimistic on this front that people are wanting to safeguard and respect Second Amendment rights. And I think more and more people beyond, let's say, your typical Republican white owning gun owner, white gun owner, you're seeing a lot more diverse gun owners come to the fold. You start to see more black gun owners. You start to see more women gun owners and Asian gun owners. Everyone across the board is now discovering the Second Amendment, even across political lines, too. So you can't say it's just Republicans who champion this. You also will see independents and Democrats start to come around and I think maybe shed their preconceived notions or past preconceived notions about gun control. Yeah. Interesting times. With <clears throat> Gabriella Hoffman, she played her today, ladies and gentlemen, she uh, got through it for her and we appreciate it greatly. We'll get you back on very soon. You enjoy your travels. Thank you so much for the time today. Yes. Anytime, Andrew. Good to be on with you when I'm not coughing. Um, I think we could talk more, but let's talk about lead bands next. I think that is a worthy discussion. Well, that, that'll be fun. Uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Hi, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, let's talk a little zoning, planning, city planning, urban planning, all kinds of planning, or more specifically, the lack thereof. And then you do some planning to try to make up for the non-planning, which makes it even worse. This is the guy to talk about it. He's actually got a whole book out about it. We'll talk about it in just a minute. Uh, he is a graduate of Rutgers. He's been doing all kinds of media on this. I'm excited to talk about this book because it really is an important topic that actually affects just about everybody one way or the other. Nolan Gray joining us. How are you, sir? Thank you so much for the time today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. We usually don't let Rutgers people come on unsupervised, but we'll make an <laughs> exception for you, my friend. Sorry, I'm, I'm a WVU guy. The old grudges die oh, well, it's even worse. conference. I mean, in my heart of hearts, I'm a Kentucky fan. So um, oh. even, even worse <laughs> for you. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, Rutgers doesn't give you a lot to inspire loyalty from an athletics perspective. Uh, yeah. I, but uh, I, I do bleed blue. People that don't know, a huge amount of WVU's enrollment actually comes from New Jersey. So that's part of the end joke of that. Uh, not that anybody oh, yeah. cares about oh. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let's start with some nomenclature because here's the problem with things like this is they get buzzwordy online really fast, especially in social media. And people have their little clicks and they'll talk about, you know, affordable housing or they talk about zoning. Let's take zoning and break it down because that's going to mean different things to different people. Urban folks, they hear zoning. They're going to start thinking, oh, uh, development, maybe urban blight, maybe gentrification. Uh, suburban folks, they hear uh, zoning. They start thinking, oh, they're going to tear down houses and build strip malls. A rural person may never have dealt with zoning and not have any idea what it is other than that thing people argue about on Facebook. Just deal with the nomenclature, break it down for a little bit, what we're actually dealing with when it comes to zoning. Right. So so zoning is a system of regulation that we have in cities, suburbs, in some rural context that does two things. Uh, the first is it tells you what uses are allowed on every single parcel in a city. Uh, so broadly speaking, that's, you know, residential, commercial, industrial. But then within each of those categories, there are subcategories. So in some residential areas, you are not legally allowed to build an apartment. In others, uh, you maybe can legally build townhouses, but not a duplex. Uh, in about 95 percent of the typical U.S. metropolitan area, it's illegal to build anything other than a single family home. A detached single family home in a residential area. Uh, we'll talk about that, how that ties into housing affordability issues. The second thing that zoning does is it 
places uh, strict limits on density. So it tells you what you can build and then how much of that you can build, how much floor area you can build in maybe a commercial development or how many units you can build in a residential development. And you know, as is probably implied by the, by the uh, title of the book, I tend to think a lot of these standards are arbitrary uh, and they've played a role in, in, in making uh, US cities uniquely dysfunctional. Yeah, uh, that's called a segue. We call it Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City and How to Fix It. That's Nolan Gray's book. We're going to link it in the show notes. Make sure you buy the book and read its entirety. Let's start right there, though. Um, arbitrary line. Here's here's a problem we have where it's a language problem, because we keep talking about government and zoning and regulations as if there's these things that drop out of the either. No, these are government things, but there's people behind there making those decisions, which means good, bad or indifferent. You get the biases of those people, you get the experience level of those people, and you get the competence level of those people. Demystify it a little bit, because I think that's part of the problem when we deal with something like zoning is it's like, oh, well, somebody somewhere is doing that. No, there's people doing this. And to really understand the problem, you got to understand the people that are making that decision, right? No, that's exactly right. I mean, I think the way that zoning traditionally certainly was framed was, okay, let's get all the smartest guys in the room and come up with a master plan that's going to control every every little detail for what you can and can't do on every single lot in a metropolitan area over the next, um, you know, 50 years. Right. Uh, so it's, it's very kind of, very kind of this mid century modern kind of idea of, you know, we can, we can just get the elites all together and solve this problem um, and deal with problems like incompatible neighbors or deal with problems like coordinating growth with new infrastructure investment. I think exactly, I think you made this point very well. Um, it doesn't end up working out exactly that way. Uh, certain biases come into the picture. Uh, people start using uh, some of these rules uh, as a way to maybe uh, suppress new construction. If I'm a, for example, if I'm a, a property owner, right? If I own uh, some office floor area, it's in my interest to prevent other people from building more of it. So the price just keeps going up. Or if I own uh, residential property in a community, right? It's at least partly to my benefit to block new properties from getting built uh, that increases the value of my asset. Uh, and that's kind of this dysfunctional flow that we've gotten into in many cities. And then, of course, uh, it's been used as a tool for segregation, uh, of course, in the U.S. context, both on the basis of race, but also income. If you can say, hey, um, if you want to uh, build a home in this neighborhood, you have to have at least two acres of land, uh, even though the market might sustain maybe 5,000 square foot lots. If you have the power to say, you know, uh, set standards like that, you have the power to determine who can and can't live in any given neighborhood. And so what you see in many U.S. cities is these rules have been uh, used to uh, make housing uh, much more affor uh, much more unaffordable and have also been used to segregate uh, cities, both on race and class. Yeah, Nolan Gray joining us. Here's the thing. There's certain things in our parlance when it talks about the other side of the tracks is a good one, and people may not realize that. Comes. That's based in facts, though, because it was like, oh, well, that side of the train tracks isn't desirable property this side a lot of this goes back to some basic things like property rights the tax base thing that's a huge part of zoning talk about that for just a second because those are some of the elements that go into it that are kind of fundamental but once we start talking about affordable housing and stuff we kind of forget about those basic building blocks so just touch on that real quick yeah absolutely i mean I, so in the book i sketch out i think one of the four big things that have gone wrong with zoning uh the, the first is the they it's it's made housing much more expensive by making it harder to build and forcing it to be more expensive than it might otherwise have been it's made it harder for people to move to high opportunity areas maybe thriving cities that are growing uh it's uh made it easier for for uh, bad actors to uh, enforce segregation in U.S. cities, and then it's forced cities to take on maybe a more sprawling form that they might otherwise have. And we can get into all of those. Uh, but I think you're exactly right. I mean, this is an element of the book that I actually don't touch on very directly, uh, but the property rights issue, right, is that um, zoning basically puts incredibly strict parameters on what everybody can and can't do with their property. You know, so right now, one of the issues that we're scrambling to deal with, of course, is, well, we need to allow people to actually build maybe something like an accessory dwelling unit or a granny flat in their backyard. That should be legal. In many U.S. contexts, that's illegal. Or uh, you should be allowed to operate a home-based business out of your home, right? Of course, over the last two years, many millions of Americans have started working from home. But in many contexts, zoning actually makes that illegal. Of course, that's a that's a major property rights uh, concern that uh, you know, I think many people rightly have. And before we get into the details of this, since you just mentioned it, I do want to ask you about it is 
How much of this, you, you use the term mid-century thinking. You just talked about the COVID pandemic where people really started embracing technology out of necessity. I think it changed a lot of people's views on things. How much of this is not even the math of it or the politics or the policy? How much of it is just changing generational thought on how we address this issue? Because there seems to be, I know post-COVID, everybody's kind of looking at everything all of a sudden. It's because when you're locked in your house, you start thinking about your house. Let's just put it on a basic mm -hmm. human level. How much of this is just a generational thought change that we're in the middle of, and we maybe don't have the nomenclature and the policy to match it all yet? Uh, that's a really great point. I think there's two elements here. I think this was part of a broader project of making the detached single family home the norm. Uh, and in the context of maybe post-World War II, that was fine. We had a lot of land that was very cheap. But now a starter home doesn't look like a detached single family home on a maybe a 5,000 square foot lot in many U.S. cities. In many U.S. cities, a starter home might look like a townhouse or it might look like half of a duplex. Uh, and those are types of houses that we actually make illegal to build today. Land prices have just gone up so much that that, that old uh, Levittown style 5,000 square foot lot uh, just is not economical. Um, and two, I think also zoning has entrenched, I think, a cultural norm of this idea of your neighborhood should never change, right? You move into a neighborhood and when you buy a home in a neighborhood, you're buying uh, some collective right into that neighborhood never ever changing. You know, healthy, healthy neighborhoods and healthy uh, communities are, are, are constantly changing, right? And I, the way I frame it to people is like, you can either have all the buildings in your neighborhood remain the same forever, uh, or uh, you can have, uh, you know, the relative demographic composition of your community change, right? So you see so many neighborhoods in a place like California, where I am now, where they haven't built any new housing for the past 50 years. So in one sense, you know, they look the same, but in another sense, no young family can afford to buy a home there. There's no children there. Uh, it's mostly folks who are retired, empty nesters, their their family, their kids can't afford to live in that community. So they moved to a place like uh, Nevada or Arizona. Uh, and the, yeah, the built form of the neighborhoods remains the same, which was the purpose of zoning, but their community for all intents and purposes has, coll has collapsed. And, and this was, I think, this has been a California problem for a long time, but what we're seeing it now increasingly is spread uh, to places in the Mountain West or places in the South. Yeah. All the places those folks are going to get away from the problem to start with, ironically enough. Nolan Gray joining us. You bring up something I want to ask you about because it just kind of triggered a thought in my head, though. This is not going to be a one-size-fits-all problem because what is affordable housing in a city, like you said, maybe multifamily, maybe uh, apartments that are affordable, maybe townhouse-style stuff. You go out more rurally, like where I'm from. Look, I lived in the double wide until I was 11. That's affordable housing where I come from. You get a trailer, right? This is not going to look the same everywhere. Is this something where we need to have a set of principles in place and then be a little bit flexible in the application thereof? Yeah, you know, I think one way to approach this issue is to have more state level. So the way we do zoning today is every single municipality gets to write their own zoning code, basically de novo. Uh, so they can come up with their own unique standards. And this makes the whole system very, very complicated. And it also makes it to where maybe a developer in one city can't necessarily build one you know, the next city over without hiring an attorney and a local planner and all these other things that increase costs. Um, but so one thing you can do is you can set sort of baseline state standards to say, as you know, as a few states have now done to say, okay, look, Statewide, if you're in a residential district, uh, you can build an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, statewide, uh, you can operate a home-based business. Uh, statewide, local governments can't force you to build uh, giant parking lots and giant parking garages that don't make any economic sense. Um, and then you say to local governments, hey, within these broad parameters, you can still plan your city, but the most extreme abuses of, of zoning, of course, we're not going to tolerate. Yeah, Nolan Gray joining us. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to dig into this book. He has three cities. He uses examples. Very diverse cities, very different cities, very different parts of the country. Why did he pick those three? What does they talk about zoning? Also going to get into the arbitrary lines. This great book from Nolan Gray. He's joining us on Herd Tell, and we'll continue with him right after this. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. We are talking to Nolan Gray. He's got a great book out on zoning and urban planning and city planning, how zoning broke the American city and how to fix it. Arbitrary lines. Great title, by the way. Love it. OK, let's dig into this a little bit. You, The core of the book, you took three cities as living examples. These are cities most people would know just on name. 
They're very diverse cities. They're different parts of the country. Why did you pick these three cities as your examples? Yeah, well, I mean, so the main example that I look at in the book is, is Houston, right? So, you know, Houston is unique uh, in that it's a uh, it's the it's fourth largest American city, right? And on track to be the third largest American city. Uh, it's incredibly affordable, uh, despite, a, you know, a few decades of just exponential population and income growth. Uh, and it's also unique in that it's the only major American city that does not have zoning. So what does this mean? This means that Houston doesn't have the system wide, the citywide system of regulation uh, that says what uses uh, are allowed on every single property and at what density. Of course, they have a whole bunch of other rules to deal with things like nuisances or uh, preventing development in environmentally sensitive areas, uh, or they even engage in a whole bunch of stuff that people generally think of as city planning, like parks planning or streets planning. But they don't do this sort of weird game that every other city plays where they engage in a system of of, of citywide land use regulation uh, through zoning. And so, you know, what gets you is actually a relatively successful city. Uh, they have, as I say, they have other mechanisms for engaging in city planning, uh, but they've been able to remain relatively affordable as, you know, more zoned cities, of course, now struggle with these issues. And this isn't just a social and political and economic issue, though. We saw in Houston, unfortunately, when you have a natural disaster with poor zoning, this stuff can actually be deadly because they went out and, you know, they're building a lot of stuff, maybe on land that wasn't really meant to be built on, that wasn't properly zoned. That actually had a huge effect in the city of Houston also. Well, so it's tough. I mean, a lot of the wetlands development in metropolitan Houston was happening in the suburbs, which in most cases have conventional zoning. Uh, and then there are separate... or wetlands development is generally dealt with through separate ordinances right so you'll have you'll have rules that say what you can and can't build in wetlands uh and of course you know i mean like that was separate of zoning and, and houston was a little too callous about that going into for example uh, uh hurricane harvey uh but um yeah i mean I, I actually not having zoning in houston is probably a huge asset in the recovery period right so so houston actually experienced population growth uh the year that the hurricane hit uh, and it's partly because it's so easy to rebuild in, in Houston, right? It, you know, it's, it, properties that get destroyed, you can very, you can fairly easily rebuild them uh, and then build them to higher standards than you could maybe in a place like Los Angeles or San Francisco, where, of course, there would be much stricter regulatory rigmarole. And the actual regulations make a lot of what currently exists illegal. Uh, Houston, of course, doesn't have all those problems. So it's very easy to build and it's very easy for the city to adapt and change over time. You took a couple of cities that um, maybe not as famous as Houston, which I think a lot of people will be shocked at how big Houston is. It's the fourth largest city and growing. Um, you talk about Minneapolis, you talk about Fayetteville, you talk about Hartford. Uh, Minneapolis, is, of course, is a big metro. Fayetteville, Hartford, more kind of maybe mid-level to large cities. Why those cities? What got your attention there? Yeah, so, I mean, all across the country, cities are contending with liberalizing these regulations, right? Because th there's broad recognition now that these rules are standing in the way of letting cities adapt uh, and, and grow over time. Uh, so Minneapolis, of course, uh, abolished a, a policy called single family zoning. This is what I was referencing earlier. Uh, these are rules that basically make it illegal to build townhouses or duplexes or small apartment buildings in the vast majority of most U.S. cities. Uh, Minneapolis scrapped those rules uh, and uh, they're still tinkering with them. Uh, but it's starting to allow for more of this infill housing development. So you can get smaller, more affordable housing typologies in existing neighborhoods, leveraging existing infrastructure. Uh, and that helps to keep the city affordable. Uh, I like the example of, of, of Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, because I think a lot of people tend to think like, oh, OK, you know, big cities have these problems. Big cities are going to do zoning reform. But maybe a midsize college town like Fayetteville, that's not really relevant to us. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky, which is a very, very similar context to Fayetteville. And you look at Fayetteville and they've said, OK, hey, you know, we're going to get we, we actually want more infill development. We want to legalize those Main Street uh, developments, those Main Street storefronts that so often in many small towns just sit empty. Uh, let's get rid of some of the rules that, that block uh, entrepreneurs in our community from leveraging some of those properties and revitalizing some of our streets. And one of the rules that they, they zeroed in on were parking mandates, which say if you want to operate a shop or if you want to build uh, maybe a small apartment building, you have to build a huge parking lot. Right. I mean, this is why. You know, you you drive on any co major corridor in America, and there are these huge empty parking lots, parking lots that are so big that they don't even fill up on Black Friday. If they don't fill up on Black Friday, uh, they probably don't need to be built that big. Uh, but so Fayetteville said, you know, we're going to scrap some of these rules. Um, Hartford, of course, in Connecticut, similar story, right? This is much more of a, a Rust Belt dynamic, you know, a city that's experienced population loss. 
but they're liberalizing a lot of these rules too, to say, hey, we want people to come back into our community. We want people to invest and build. Let's get rid of some of the regulatory barriers to people doing that. One of the keys to the book that you really wanted to focus on was there's been all these different ideas and thoughts about zoning and urban planning and city planning over the years. You wanted to try to bring them kind of together into a little bit more of one cohesive thing to try to understand the problem. Just for a lay person that doesn't know all the nomenclature, maybe doesn't know a lot about zoning, what's two or three of the things that they should know if they go to like discuss this online with their friends or on social media? They, I'm sure they see the trends every now and then, you know, something will pop off on Twitter or Facebook. What's the couple things they should be looking for in those discussions that should really pique their interest and like, okay, this is something I need to pay attention to? That's a really great question. I mean, I would say, I, I, I would say first, a very common misunderstanding. Zoning doesn't get anything built. Uh, zoning only stops things from being built, right? So for example, when you have a policy like single family zoning and you get rid of it, that doesn't mean that it's no longer legal to build a single family home. That just means that it's now legal to build things other than single family homes, right? Uh, so you, you, you get this confusion quite a lot. Same with parking mandates. People say, well, we can't get rid of parking mandates because we still need parking in our community. Well, the mandate just says we're not going to force anyone to build it. Uh, if a developer still wants to build this parking or feels it's necessary to lease out or sell a space, uh, he or she will build that parking. A mandate just says the government's not going to force you to do it anymore. Uh, that's the first. The second is I would say, you know, c consider the, the downstream cost of a lot of these policies, right? I think a lot of people... Um, they maybe support some of these policies and, uh, you know, concerned about things like community character or maybe extremely concerned about how a, a development's going to change their community. Uh, the alternative is never for a neighborhood or a community to stay the same, as I was kind of saying earlier, right? If you don't build those additional housing units, your, your city's going to change. It's just going to become much more expensive and working class families are no longer going to be able to afford a home. They're going to have to leave. They're going to have to move away. Your city's going to become less diverse, less dynamic. Uh, you know, if you make it hard for that new store, that new business to open up in a storefront, uh, the alternative might just be that that storefront sits vacant as is so often the case in many U.S. cities. Uh, and consider the downstream costs of a lot of these rules, right? You know, if we, if we make it hard, if we add rules and layers and extra onerous processes that make it hard to build, over time, that just makes it impossible for these cities to grow and remain dynamic over time. Yeah, Nolan Gray joining us. He's the author of Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City and How to Fix It. Let's talk about that fix it part, because we started this conversation talking about it behind all the zoning and the regular, whether you want to call it, you know, land use regulation, zoning, whatever. There's always going to be people behind these policies. If you go to a post zoning America, what's some of the things you put into place to make sure that the same people problems don't pop up again? Because we know the policy is only as good as the people that implement them. What would that look like? What would those steps be to keep some of the human factors from ruining whatever comes after zoning if we did repeal it? Yeah. So, I mean, I, this is a, I, I, I critique zoning, but of course I think you still need certain land use regulations. Absolutely. The question is like, how should they be structured? So I think a few things. One is regulate the impacts that people actually care about, right? So in the current system, we say, okay, we don't want to, we don't want a corner grocery coming into this little neighborhood because we're worried that it'll make too much noise and generate too much traffic. So we're just going to ban the corner grocery. Well, I would say if you're concerned about the noise and you're concerned about the traffic, regulate that or put prices on that, um, right? So, you know, we can say, hey, yeah, noisy neighbors are a problem. We're going to have relatively clear rules that are enforced consistently and fairly on noise. Or, yeah, traffic is a problem. Uh, if you're going to put a whole bunch of a, a big giant parking garage on a property, you know, you can pay a fee that cover some of the costs that you're imposing on neighbors. I think that sort of regulation is completely appropriate. And that's really what people want from line use regulation. They want these impacts to be regulated. I would say the second thing is a recognition of the extent to which a lot of these problems solve themselves, right? So if you look at unzoned contexts like Houston, uh, you know, the nightmare scenario of an oil refinery opening up in a suburban cul-de-sac, it just doesn't materialize in practice, right? Uh, these are very different uses that want to be in different places. But then for conflicts that people are concerned about, neighbors are actually very good at coming together and developing emergent solutions to solve these problems, right? So, of course, people form neighborhood associations that voluntarily opt into certain land use rules for maybe a community where it's like, yeah, we want this to be a, a neighborhood of detached single family homes. People can voluntarily opt into those rules, but maybe it's not appropriate for the local government to be adopting and enforcing these rules at, at the public expense. Um, and then the third, I think, big piece of it is you do need uh, planning work. And, and we don't do a very good job of this in the US, but you do need people uh, who are stewarding the public realm. You need civil servants doing this work of planning out streets 
that make sense, planning out parks at uh, regular intervals, planning out where public facilities are going to be. We actually don't do a lot of this work uh, in the U.S. today, and that's why so many U.S. suburbs kind of look like a, a, a mess of winding streets and aimless cul-de-sacs and, and power centers, and you have to drive everywhere, and you can't walk in any context, uh, and there's very little mixture of uses. Uh, we can do some of the physical planning work to actually build communities that people like and then say, hey, we're going to plan out the public realm, and then what you do on your private land, uh, we leave up to you. Uh, Nolan Gray's joining us. All right, let's do a real world example to kind of put a bow on this. Everything we've just learned from you that you explained so well that even I understood most of it. There's a couple of things I'm going to have to Google later. Um, <laughs> let's just take this example because I'm for freedom. I'm generally a free market kind of guy. I want people to expand. I want capitalism to succeed. At the same time, every time I see a strip mall go up, I feel a part of my soul dying because it's just like, it, I, look, I'm happy people are working. I'm glad people are getting their businesses in. I hope the rent ain't too high, which is the case in a lot of those. I think a lot of people feel that way, though. It's like, hey, they have their principles on these things. But then in the real world, when you start building a building somewhere where they go every day, maybe it's a school, maybe it's where they shop. Usually, more and more of those are usually pretty close together. That's a common feeling with people, though. You see it over and over again. How do they start squaring those two things of like, well, I want affordable housing and I want, you know, good urban planning, but I also want things like I like. How do we square those things out in a pluralistic, diverse society? Because that's just a real question, because people are still going to feel that way, even if they have the principles and belief system. Right. So how do we bridge that? That is a real challenge. I mean, I would say uh, to your specific example, the strip mall, I mean, the strip mall is the ultimate product of zoning, right? I mean, you you, you basically say, we're not going to allow small commercial that's integrated into neighborhoods. It's going to have to be in one place and it's going to have to have a ton of parking and it's going to have to be set back 50 feet from the street, right? The strip mall is, is a creature of, of zoning. And I would say just to kind of expand that out, I think a lot of the development that people see that they just don't like, that they see maybe as draining, uh, you know, resources from their community or requires a whole bunch of infrastructure that's very expensive on taxpayers. Uh, a lot of that is downstream of these zoning rules uh, that mandate a very kind of sprawling, low slung, auto oriented form of development and actually actually criminalizes uh, some of the main streets that, that many communities have that they love. Uh, right. So that traditional development of ground floor shops and then apartments over top. Not everybody wants to live like that, and I respect that, but a lot of Americans do. And if you actually look at the numbers, right, those inner suburban neighborhoods that have a mixture of maybe a duplex next to a single family home, next to some townhouses with a deli on the corner, maybe a barber shop within walking distance, maybe a doctor's office, maybe somebody is, uh, uh, a lady is offering uh, musical lessons out of her home, right? These are the kind of communities that were, str that were strong and resilient and that remain extremely desirable. And they're actually completely illegal to build. Uh, in many U.S. cities today. And I think when you when you sort of make people realize this, it, it immediately starts to click. The type of neighborhoods that we want uh, so desperately, the, the ones when we have them, we cherish them and we, we actually put historic overlays on them. But then we say, you can't build neighborhoods like that anymore. Uh, zoning, of course, is one of the key barriers uh, to building the types of cities that many people uh, so desperately want. Yeah. And not to bash on the strip malls, but there's ways to do that even in suburbia where I know there's a there's a large development. I got to watch it be built because it was a field when I first moved down there. And they, you know, they built the shopping area with the movie theater and the restaurants and all the different various view stuff. And they put the mid level to middle high range homes, single family homes on one side. And then they put the apartment community on the other side, all same developer. And both are walkable to the shopping in the middle. There's ways to do this that make not everybody happy, but a lot of people happy and everybody say, what's the key here? Is it politically? Is it policy? Is it a ratio between the two? For us that want to advocate with our elected officials, which is where this stuff always goes through and then the money people get involved. So we're real about this. What's the ratio there between policy and politics and just us, you know, frankly giving a damn for lack of a better term. What's the ratio there to make this stuff better? Yeah. I mean, I would say first at the local level, local governments have huge amount of latitude over a lot of these rules, right? So you, many U.S. cities and suburbs will have a zoning ordinance that was written, you know, 30 to 50 years ago, and will have a whole bunch of rules that make this type of desirable uh, infill development illegal. Local governments can amend those rules today, right? Uh, they have a huge amount of power. At the state level, it's appropriate, I think, for state legislators to say, let's put up some guardrails on this, right? Let's allow those accessory dwelling units, let's get rid of the parking mandates, let's reintroduce some flexibility uh, back into the system. I would say too, in terms of moving away from zoning completely as a concept rather than just amending it, 
I'd say get some of these other things right. You know, get the nuisance regulation right. Uh, you know, help communities uh, develop their own sets of rules if they want if they want them. Uh, uh, get the physical planning right, and then put zoning back to a vote. Right, ask people, do you want this institution? In some cases, people will, but I think in many cases, people will say, yeah, actually, you know, our community is better without these rules that that segregate uses or that just don't allow us to actually build any infill. Uh, and you know, once you kind of get to that level, then I think we'll really be able to move past zoning and, and we'll have a much stronger, more prosperous, more diverse uh, American city on the other side. He's Nolan Gray. The book is Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City and How to Fix It. It's a great book. We've linked to it in the show notes, how you can get it, but let folks know anywhere where you would like them to get it. And until we see you again on Hertel, which I hope is soon, where they can follow you with your social media, your writing, you're doing media for the book. Obviously, it's going to be a big success. Let folks know where they can follow you and keep up with you, my friend. Yeah, well, I'm on Twitter, M Nolan Gray, N O L A N G R A Y. Um, you can follow me there. I'm sharing thoughts on zoning. Uh, yeah, the book's available pretty much everywhere. I'm, I always say to people, if you have a local bookstore uh, that you want to support, go go uh, grab a copy there. Ask that they stock it. Uh, you can of course get it on Amazon or Bookshop. Uh, easiest way is to order directly from the press, Island Press, uh, or just uh, request that your local library stock a copy. Uh, but uh, there's many ways to get it. We got an audio book coming out uh, shortly. Unfortunately, I'm not the one narrating it. Uh, but uh, yeah, many exciting things. I look forward to hearing from people. Yeah, it's an important topic. It's one that doesn't get as loud as some other stuff, but it probably should because, hey, we've all got to live here and we got to all live together. We should probably do a better job planning that out. Nolan Gray, thank you so much. We'll definitely have you back to talk more because these issues are never going to go away as long as people are living in America, which I hope is for a long, long time. Thank you so much for your time today, sir. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you, sir. Welcome back to Hertel. Okay, we've leaned on him this entire midterm season. He's had a couple of weeks off with not a whole lot going on. Boy, did this make up for it, though, this past Tuesday. We got some big-name races, a lot of stuff to go through. Joe Zemanski, he is the uh, head of Elections Daily's Daily Race Ratings team. Uh, he's one of these George Mason kids, but we'll forgive him that because he brings good information. How are you, sir? Great to have you back. Oh, great to be back, Andrew. Uh, I am running on... Uh... <laughs> Last night's energy and vibes right now, running about four and a half hours of sleep from last night, but you know I love it. Yeah, when we have these Western, one of the reasons we waited an extra day to cover this was these were Western races, especially Arizona and Washington, so we knew we weren't going to have the results. Um, let's just start right there. Big ticket item, Arizona still waiting on some results. Where are we as of the recording of this uh, afternoon of Wednesday for Thursday's program? Where are we at? Yeah, so uh, in Arizona right now, uh, in the Senate race, obviously they had two key massive uh, Republican primaries. Uh, the Senate primary uh, to go up against Mark Kelly for the full term in that Senate seat, and as well as the governor's race to finish off against, uh, uh, to replace Doug Ducey. Uh, the Senate primary on that side has already been called Blake Masters, as expected as Republican nominee there. However, in the gubernatorial race, uh, we have not yet called, no one has yet called that race. Uh, Kari Lake, the Trump-endorsed former anchorwoman who's gone through a certain amount of controversies, up by about 11,300 votes right now. It's not a big lead right now for Lake. What we're mainly waiting on right now, it seems like, is late arriving votes in from Maricopa County. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see. These are apparently early votes I've seen online. Uh, we're still waiting on some election day vote for some of these places, but otherwise right now, it seems like this is all going to be coming down to the late arriving early vote in Maricopa County, and we'll tend to see Robson, Robson, from what I've been told, needs to win that batch by about six and a half points. If she does, she will overtake Lake. If she does not, then Kari Lake is the nominee, and thus setting up that race in Arizona. Now, of course, we've been talking about Maricopa County since 2020 <laughs> election, because that was ground zero for all the hot mess out in Arizona. Kari Lake has been talking about it nonstop. Uh, the MAGA wing of the Republican Party has been talking about it nonstop. If this lingers, Carrie Lake was starting with election nonsense before this. they even started voting on Monday and Tuesday. 
how ugly is this going to get the closer it is? Do we need a definitive winning just for the good of the voting public here, or is this going to devolve and get really ugly really fast? Yeah, if this stays a close race, this is this is undoubtedly going to get ugly. A report say that Lake has already hired the notorious uh, fake lawyer uh, Jenna Ellis to potentially defend her or to uh, litigate voting results in Arizona come uh, this primary. So it'll be really, really interesting to see kind of what comes from that there. Because, you know, like I said, if these Maricopa ballots, even if, you know, Robeson doesn't win them by enough, if she wins them and thus, you know, tines this race down to a percent or maybe even less than that, then this this is going to be a very, very close election. Very much like the Pennsylvania Senate race, where it's not going to be done yet, potentially for another couple of weeks here as we kind of go through the motions of potentially dealing with a recount. Does this help or hurt uh, the Republican chances going forward? There's already been talk about all, if it's Carrie Lake because of all the controversy, because of all the baggage that might change this race a little bit. If this drags on though, does that hurt them going into the general election and what's probably going to be a pretty tight one? I I think it's a pretty undeniable thing that it would hurt uh, the Republican Party uh, in Arizona. I mean, the Arizona Republican Party is as as a structure is already kind of weak as it is currently. Uh, you know, I, I think a continued long drawn out uh, primary count here, and especially in this gubernatorial race, especially with Kari Lake being right in the center of it, uh, it's it would be damaging. I think to the general election, and I think it could potentially make things very volatile for November. Obviously, we've seen. Uh, candidates come together before under tough circumstances but this this is this has been a bloody race already uh if we continue to see it get bloodier after the count uh this is this is going to be hard to i think come together for the november election in arizona for sure katie hobbs is awaiting uh she won the democratic primary very handily it was a quick call for her uh oddly enough she's technically in charge of these elections although there's there's some nomenclature there to be involved how do you rate it? I know it's hard to do, and we don't know the person yet, but where's this race going to stand? In fact, just do it one way or the other. Is there going to be a mark? Is this like one of those things like Mastriona where it could swing it one way or the other just because of who the nominee is, or is this just going to be a bloodbath all the way through? Uh, personally, I think even even if it's Kari Lake, the big difference between this race and Pennsylvania is that Katie Hobbs is no Josh Shapiro. Uh, Hobbs has some baggage of her own. There's been a lot of claims uh, coming from her office of Secretary of State and from her campaign of a uh, very bad work environment, of a potentially abusive work environment. Uh, There's been claims of discrimination from her Secretary of State office from former employees there. Uh, You know, even with Kari Lake, Hobbs is not as strong as, say, a Josh Shapiro in terms of, you know, uh, just general cleanliness i would say in in terms of scandal hobbs does have some baggage to her she's certainly not a perfect candidate for arizona democrats uh honestly if karen taylor ropes in order to pull this out uh looking at the candidates themselves and looking at arizona as a state in you could in theory actually make a stronger argument for leans republican in that regard than you could for toss-up even if i think lake versus hobbs this is still a toss-up race this is still arizona uh we should not forget how close this state was in 2020, this was a state that was decided by only 11,000 votes. People, let's be let's be especially in the presidential election. This was an 11,000 vote race. Let's be very, very clear and honest where we find ourselves on that stand. This is going to be a close race in this open gubernatorial race with no incumbent with what's going on. It's going to be a tight race. Uh, this is a toss up race, even if Carly likes the nominee. All right, let's finish up Arizona over on the Senate side. There's some undercard stuff that's not quite. We'll revisit that later because we're gonna we're gonna be talking about Maricopa County and the election stuff at a future date. But for now, big picture stuff. Uh, Blake Masters won his race. Mark Kelly is waiting for him. It's not gotten a lot of press, but Mark Kelly has been an absolute money print uh, for the Democratic Party. He is one of the best fundraisers they have. He has gobs of money. The way the primary has gone down, he's just kind of been riding along, not really being involved in anything. Blake Masters has got a lot of backing. He's one of Peter Thiel's guys. He's out at camp with J.D. Vance and some other ones. This is going to be a very expensive fight. I suspect this one gets ugly in a hurry. How do you rate it? Uh, Right now, this is definitely a toss-up race. Uh, Again, even with Masters, and Masters is another one who could arguably have some baggage. Uh, There are some past quotes from past articles and things he's written. Uh, There's some current quotes now from the campaign. There's a quote uh, that he said that he would defund Social Security. 
which while I'm sure there are multiple Republicans out there who would support the idea of that uh, in a state like Arizona, where there are numerous uh, uh, elder individuals that make up the voting base, there is a lot of boomers that depend on Social Security for that uh, fixed income. You know, that is a that is a problematic statement for sure. This is still a toss up race, though. I would say that the fundamentals would support Kelly a little bit more in terms of potentially making this a lean Democratic race than, say, the gubernatorial race does. Kelly is an incumbent. And again, I, I want to mention 2020 again. I want to bring this up. Don't forget that Kelly did overperform Joe Biden by a pretty significant amount uh, in Arizona in 2020 when he was running concurrently in that special election uh, against Martha McSally. It was uh, he, he ran about a point and a half above Joe Biden in that regards. Uh, I don't think that's something that should be overlooked either. Uh, in regards to this race, uh, Kelly does seem to potentially have some semblance of a stronger, you know, ability as a can as a candidate, maybe especially around the Tucson area. He was relatively stronger than uh, Biden was there in that Tucson area, especially in 2020. So that's going to be a key area here in this uh, 2022 race is going to be that Tucson area around Pima County. That'll be a key area to see if uh, Kelly continues to over overperformance there, or if he's kind of dragged down into a much closer race thanks to the environment that we could potentially be expecting. One last note on Arizona. It's not been talked about because the people that are running for office has been sucking up all the attention. What is Doug Ducey's future, do you think? He he appeals to certain parts of the Republican Party. He's had some success as governor by certain metrics. Uh, some of the other mess, he, he hasn't even gotten really in all the stuff about the election and stuff. That all kind of went on underneath him. He seemed to be able to stay above that to a large extent. What do you reckon his future is and next step for that guy is? He's kind of in an interesting spot, isn't he? Yeah, there's been a lot of talk that Ducey is looking into 2024 as a time where he could run for Senate. Uh, if he decides he wants a future in politics, that's basically it for him. Uh, he's certainly no sure thing to win that primary in 2024. But from what I've heard, that is currently his target right now. Is that 2024 race against Kirsten Cinema and or Ruben Gallego uh, when that Democratic primary will almost assuredly go down in 2024? I'll give him respect just for waiting after ending his governorship before jumping to another race. I'll give him that much. And that is a primary that is going to be very ugly. So there is a very good chance, even in a purple state, that's very contentious. Uh, that ain't bad strategy at all, is it? Because cinema is definitely going to be a target by her own party, isn't she? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, Ruben Gallego, uh, the current, I believe he is the uh, seventh. Di uh, no, he is the third district. Now they redid the, they did, they redid some of the numbers, excuse me. So he is now the third district uh, rep under the, under the renumbering of uh, Arizona's congressional district. He's the third, he's uh, part of the Phoenix area uh, and he's relatively progressive. So it'll be interesting to see kind of where that race lies because he's been basically uh, trending towards challenging cinema since, uh, since the middle of the year. So we'll see where that goes when we get there in next, in the next year and a half. OK, the feel good story for those of us that follow politics and have anything vaguely resembling integrity and a conscious and a soul. Uh, let's go over to Missouri real quick. The show me state before we even get into it. Thank God Eric Greetens lost and he lost soundly. It wasn't even close. He was a distance third. Um, I don't want to even get into all of it. He, of course, resigned as governor. He's had more scandals since then. He's embroiled in a really ugly divorce custody case with even more abuse allegations. Boy, this is just a good old-fashioned win for America in good faith, don't you think? I would have to say uh, definitely a early uh, evening sigh of relief. Missouri counted relatively quickly uh, in regards to most of the other states that we saw last night. That's because Missouri, compared to most of the other states that we saw last night, actually has a pretty limited early and mail-in voting period. So most of the votes that we saw from the get-go were election day votes uh, in Missouri. That allowed for a pretty quick counting process. By around 9 p.m., it was pretty clear that Eric Schmidt was going to be a Republican nominee. And by a pretty soundly way, too, uh, Greitens, actually, he had been projected to be in second 
by a good chunk of late polling. In the end, he fell in third. Uh, Vicki Hartzler, you could actually argue, probably overperformed in her congressional district area a little bit. Uh, in, the, in the central part of the state as well, too, around Je- around uh, Columbia, the Jefferson City area, she maybe overperformed her expectations there a little bit. Uh, but Eric Schmidt ran away in the St. Louis area and those exurban suburbs there, crucial to the Republican vote there, totally ran away in that eastern part of the state. And uh, that's what really drew him to victory and certainly a big sigh of relief for Republicans uh, that Eric Schmidt will be joining fellow attorney, Gen- uh, fellow former Missouri Attorney General uh, Josh Hawley in the halls of the United States Senate, almost certainly we have this ready to say far. The only Kenna that we would have even considered moving this race away from say far with is with Greitens. And uh, he is far, far away from that Senate seat now. So uh, uh, Eric Schmidt, uh, almost, almost certainly, I don't want to say certainly because you never know, but almost certainly will be heading to the United States and to replace Roy Blunt uh, in, after the 2022. And the thing about that is uh, Cook agreed with you. They actually swung this as soon as this was announced. They had the same feeling that Greetings would have put this in danger. Uh, he's going to go up against Trudy Bush Valentine. That's not Bushes in the Texas Bush. That's Bushes in the Anheuser dynasty Bushes. But since he's probably going to win and he's favored to win, who is Eric Schmidt? Because we spent a lot of time talking about all the others. Uh, Trump endorsed both Eric's kind of somewhat funnily. I don't know if that was on purpose or not. We'll just leave that for some other time. Who is this guy, though? Uh, Eric Schmidt is the current attorney general of Missouri. Uh, He's uh, actually been described as one of the more right wing attorney generals uh, in America. Uh, But he kind of uh, got his uh, gains back after post Roe v. after the post Dobbs decision, actually. Uh, He took a lot of advantage of that, pretty much acted immediately to basically ban abortion in the state of Missouri. Uh, That uh, since that moment uh, in, you know, around what was that, June, late May, early June. Uh, when when that occurred, uh, when that decision was handed down, uh, excuse me, late late June, excuse me, late June, when that decision came down officially from the Supreme Court, uh, Schmidt acted very quickly. That brought up a lot to him. Uh, that brought him a lot of certainly a lot of uh, notoriety among the uh, American, uh, the Missouri gubernatorial base. Here, uh, this is a guy who has certainly. Uh, basically done the job here that you would that you would think a republican attorney general would do if he'd want to run for higher office here and uh yeah that's that's basically it he'll be another relatively right-wing member of the gop senate caucus not you know in probably extreme right wing but he'll be another incredibly right-wing member of that caucus as to be expected when you come from a state like missouri uh he'll be certainly part of that more conservative wing of that senate caucus on the republican side Big picture, we talked about Arizona being a swing state now. Georgia's looking like it's getting a little more purple as you go. Missouri's gone the other way. It used to be a swing state. I don't think we can call it a swing state anymore, can we? No, I mean, it uh, It looked pretty gone in 20, uh, 2016 after Trump pretty massively overperformed expectations there. Uh, 2018, obviously, then Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill uh, lost her race uh, for re-election in the United States Senate to Josh Hawley, even though it was a Democratic wave year. Uh, again, 2020, a pretty heavy Republican sweep. Uh, 2022 is off the radar. Uh, it's been a very quick shift to Missouri. Uh, there's been some gains in the St. Louis suburbs, but not nearly enough to change to from the dark but not super dark red to now the very, very dark red basically everywhere else but Kansas City, parts of Missouri now. Uh, a lot of these other exurban and rural areas have shifted very heavily to Republican Party, and it's going to make it very, very hard for Democrats to win that state. Uh, in any race, quite honestly, for probably a little while here. Yeah, Joe Zemanski, elections-daily.com. They do great work. Long, like, They actually had to take a break in the live stream last night because it's so long. Make sure you're watching our live stream coverage of these things. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we got a couple more states. Kansas, probably the shocking result of the night, at least in the commentariat. Very surprising result out there. Didn't have anything to do with a candidate either. Just a real hot button issue. State of Washington. Uh, a couple other things we're going to talk about. Joe Zemanski on Hertel right after this break. Uh, welcome back to Heard Tell. We're talking to our good friend Joe Zemanski. He's our go-to guy out of elections-daily.com. Um, let's go to Kansas. This was the shock of the night for a lot of people, and it was a ballot initiative. It was a constitutional amendment. 
Uh, it was called the uh, value them both amendment. I'm going to read the amendment and then we'll get into it. It was, quote, a yes vote on the measure would remove from the state constitution the right to an abortion and hand the issue back to the state legislature. A no vote on the measure would make no changes, keeping abortion rights enshrined in the state constitution. Again, this is Kansas. It went down almost 60, 40 ish. This was kind of really a shock to a lot of people. We don't always talk ballot initiatives with you, but this is a big part of elections, these ballot initiatives. And this one really surprised folks. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this was part of the post obs era. Uh, Kansas was the first state to throw abortion on a referendum ballot uh, to send it to the people. And the people uh, <laughs> pretty clearly gave their answer on this. Uh, you know, it's a it's not even it wasn't really necessarily tracking for an abortion ban. It was just uh, taking the right to an abortion out of the Kansas Constitution. Uh, even that failed to a certain extent, because I think the growing concern was is that that would immediately go to then a uh, direct abortion ban in some capacity in the state of Kansas. Uh, surprisingly, and I say this, I say this certainly with some amount of sarcasm, but surprisingly, uh, people don't like going straight to a direct ban of things to something that's been available for the past 50 years. People don't like going to a direct ban on it for everything, potentially, uh, even in uh, serious cases of rape or incest uh, or uh, health of a mother. People don't like that, uh, and voters don't like that. We've known that for a long time, and uh, Kansas voters, even in this deep red state, certainly showed that uh, last night. And, you know, I think the total margin was a surprise to me. I wasn't necessarily surprised that it failed, but the total margin was certainly surprised to me, a loss of about 18 points. Uh, for this referendum right there. Uh, certainly a statement uh, by Kansas voters, that's for sure, uh, on the state of what they wanted to look for in this referendum. Abortion is such a hot topic because everybody's got really deep and trenched. You know, we're not changing a lot of people's minds on abortion. But data-wise, election-wise, we're starting to get some trends going here. Abortion, it means what you how you define the abortion, because if you just say abortion, people think different things. It's really starting to look like when you go to the ballot box in the general public, whether it's a red state, blue state or whatever, late term abortion, folks are pretty well against that. You start getting down in that 15, 12 week area. That's when people start pushing back and then you get below that. It kind of switch it. We, we seem to have, although it's a hot debate, we seem to have some numbers that we have a pretty well defined spectrum here of where the public is at on this, don't we? I think I, I, I cannot disagree with that in any way. That's certainly the case. And uh, yeah, it's 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 again, I think last night is a very, very clear statement from the people of Kansas to what they're looking for on this issue. I think it's a very, very clear statement, uh, undeniable what they're looking for. And again, just a, an incredibly clear statement on the issue, which is going to give uh, both parties something to consider now going into these final run up months of the campaign here. All right. There was some actual elections involving people there, too. Um, Senator Jerry Moran got his opponent, Democrat Mark Holland, won a three way race. Uh, how is Senator Moran looking for the general election? Uh, Jerry Moran, you know, this is Kansas. Uh, even though it did what it did on that abortion amendment, this is still a very, very safe race. Uh, Moran is a relatively popular incumbent here. Uh, he should have absolutely zero trouble in uh, in uh, victory. Uh, and winning the and winning Kansas uh, when the time comes yep. on election night, he he's very very safe for re-election. Incumbent Laura Kelly, uh, she's getting a challenger, Republican Derek Schmidt. Uh, in the fall, he won his race pretty handily. Uh, any chance this governorship flip? We don't. We haven't been talking a lot about governorships because the the Senate's going to be very very tight, especially with some of the uh, candidates the GOP has nominated. We're pretty sure the House is going to flip. These governorships matter. They matter a lot. We haven't been talking about them as much. What about this Kansas governorship race? Yeah, it's going to be one of the premier gov gubernatorial races. Uh, I did an article about re about uh, recently about how incumbent governors are incredibly tough to beat. Uh, in uh, Even in midterm years, there's only been about an average of two to three uh, since 2002 that have fallen. There's been basically, basically on average about two per midterm cycle that lose uh, in midterm cycles. Uh, Laura Kelly could be one of them. Uh, you know, this is a red year, still Kansas. Uh, Derek Schmidt is certainly no Chris Kobach. What Kelly does have in her favor is pretty strong approval ratings. Uh, it's been very, very hard to beat gubernatorial candidates uh, with strong uh, incumbent governors with good approval ratings in past years. It's happened before, but it's incredibly rare for it to happen. Um, this is going to be a close race. We have it at lean Republican at Elections Daily. We might be thinking about moving that back to toss up in recent days. We'll see what we do uh, come Monday when we release our next ratings uh, update. 
But however, this is going to be one of the closer gubernatorial races, but it is also probably still Republicans' best chance at flipping a gubernator, uh, governor's mansion as things stand right now in America. Interesting name on the undercard from those of us that are still having nightmares about 2020. You just mentioned Chris Korbach. He was one of the he was kind of the greetings of the life cycle, although he's not as bad of a human being as greetings. Uh, they didn't want him on the ticket then. He lost his Senate race. He's mounting his comeback. He won his primary for state AG. He's going to be facing Democrat Chris Mann. Kobach got a little comeback going, or is this going to be a dead end for him, do you think? I mean, it depends on what he does with it. Attorney General can obviously be a very active role. Kobach has certainly shown before that he will take active roles in these row offices before in Kansas. He did as Secretary of State. Uh, he will almost certainly will as Attorney General. Uh, but he's got to kind of serve out that term first, and we'll see what he does. Uh, because Kobach, uh, with this primary win, is certainly not uh, gone from our shores yet in terms of the political world. Uh, darn. It makes for good copy, but uh, I'm sure some of the Republican Party in Kansas are kind of tired of this. Let's go up north, Michigan. Uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Whitmer, excuse me, the Governor Gretchen Whitmer uh, has been very high profile over the last years for a lot of a couple of different reasons. The COVID stuff, we had the bizarre case of the uh, kidnapping plot against her. Uh, she's up for re-election. She has her challenger now. Tudor Dixon, a businesswoman and a conservative commentator, won a really messy primary that actually involves some people getting kicked off the ballot. But we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, Dixon was a Trump endorsee, not really well known. Uh, got some DeVos backing, which, of course, that's a lot of money. Uh, where's this race going to be sitting at, do you think? Uh, right now, we have a lean Democratic. Uh, there again, Whitmer is another one of those incumbent governors uh, that has a pretty solid approval rating right now from the people of Michigan. Uh, the other issue right now as well, as you mentioned, this was just such a messy primary on the Republican side. Uh, Dixon in the end comes out of it clean. She was kind of the best of the rest after James Craig and Perry Johnson got kicked off the ballot uh, due to massive, massive signature fraud that was committed by people on their campaign, uh, you know, which is never a smart thing to do. Don't, don't commit signature fraud, folks. It's actually very, very easy to find out by the laws of our elections. Uh, but, you know, Dixon was kind of the best of the rest considering the field. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how she does, of course, uh, in this campaign. Uh, you know, Michigan Republicans uh, also nominated some very, I guess you could say, interesting people for Attorney General and Secretary of State that probably won't make Dixon's job easier. Uh, of the three states uh, in the Rust Belt that Joe Biden flipped back from Donald Trump in 2020, Michigan was the state he won by the most. It has kind of the most blue elements around it. You know, you have a strong city, you have sub swinging suburbs, Grand Rapids and Kent County, you see it swinging towards them. You've got the Oakland and uh, uh, you Wayne suburbs switching very heavily, switching very heavily towards Democrats now. Uh, we really need to kind of see where this goes here. Uh, Michigan, certainly Dixon has a chance, you know, certainly she does. But right now we see Whitmer as a slight favorite. Yeah, my favorite tidbit on this on Dixon was uh, the AP at the bottom described her as a former steel industry executive I'm reading here who also hosted a conservative program on a streaming channel and once acted in a low budget zombie movie in what her campaign described as. And this is a quote, admittedly lame hobby. So no, no shortages of characters there. Uh, one last thing about Michigan. I have to ask you because we're going to be talking about this in a year or two. Uh, there is a new registered voter, or I should say a, a couple of them because they are a couple. But I think the new registered voter in the state of Michigan in the next few years might be something to keep an eye on as we're looking at some of these races go back Democrat and wide open. There's one certain transportation secretary that has moved his <laughs> flag to uh, Michigan He's got to work. We, we're talking about Pete Buttigieg. We know the numbers from 2020. He's got to work on minorities. He's got to work on disparate groups, lower classes groups. Michigan got a bunch of them. What do you see the future of him there? Because that's not accidental. Uh, I, I, I say certainly him moving to Michigan is, is at least a sign that he is at least considering running for office again. Uh, if he had stayed in Indiana, I'd say that means he was over other than potentially another presidential run. But the fact that he is moving to a state like Michigan or if he had moved to Virginia – uh, either order would have been a signal to me that he is looking for another run in office. He certainly could if he wants to. Let's not speculate here. We've still got 2024 and 2026 uh, to look forward to. But if he's not on ticket in some way in 2024, it's not hard for me to see him 
uh, running for governor in 2026 to re- either again suit a Dixon or to replace uh, the term limited Gretchen Whitmer. Yeah, and there's some whispers about Whitmer getting bumped up, uh, whether she wins governor or not. There's a lot. She's very well liked in the Biden administration and the Democratic Party. So she may be moving on before the end of her term, either which way. Let's go out way west to Washington real quick as we wrap up what happened last night. Uh, Senator Patty Murphy Murray uh, got her uh, challenger now, Republican Tiffany Smiley. Doesn't seem to be in a whole lot of danger there, but stranger things have happened. How do you have that one? We have rated as likely Democratic right now. Uh, Republicans have shown some interest in Smiley. And I do want to hold some caution here. There's only about just there's only about 48 percent of the vote counted right now in Washington state. Uh, They released their mail-in ballots very, very slowly. Uh, Hopefully we get some more today around eight Pacific time. Now, if we don't, the next rumor date isn't until Friday. Uh, So uh, it should be said as well that usually statewide, the later ballots are... uh, from uh, more right w- right wing leaning, so we could see that kind of that Democratic margin that we see in that race right now shrink down. However, I do think with this early drop, I think um, Murray's put herself in a pretty good position right now. Here, it's it's pretty hard to see this race being uh, truly competitive like it was maybe in 2010 uh, when she faced a legitimate cha- uh, legitimate uh, pretty legitimate challenge from uh, Dino Rossi, where she only won by about four and a half points that year uh, in that red wave cycle in 2010. Um, one other interesting tidbit, because they do top two voting in the state of Washington, found it interesting. Secretary of State, they've actually got an independent that came in second there. Uh, kind of odd for a state that's kind of known to be a Democratic stalwart, don't you think? Well, again, you know, this is uh, they, they base. I should say that Democrats only who have an incumbent there and in Steve Hobbs. He's taking that first spot right now. Again, only about uh only about a 20, excuse me, about 47, 48 percent of the vote counted right now. So it's uh, going to be interesting to see who kind of takes that second spot currently between uh, to face off against Hobbs. The actually the Washington Secretary of State office has been one that has actually been uh, held by Republicans in Washington for the last 50 years. It's been their one of their few statewide row offices they've held past the 80s, 90s, uh, when things took a turn for the worse in the state of Washington for them. Uh, yeah, but it'll be very interesting to see kind of where this race goes. It's the independent Anderson, and that certainly uh, changes the race on its head a little bit. And the kind of thing you see where that race lies come, uh, should be come November. It'll be very interesting to see where that race lies, I would say for sure. What do we got to look forward to going forward? This was kind of the last of the big gloppy ones, but there's still some voting to do in there. Yeah, so there are still, the, I would say that, uh, uh, excuse me, that August is kind of really the, um, uh, kind of the last real uh, big key month fest for sure normally as it as it typically is uh, throughout the month I do want to say uh, Thursday actually we just do it have on Thursday actually uh, that Tennessee will go vote uh, Tennessee of course the fifth district is a newly gerrymandered Republican district uh, cut out the area around Nashville into on uh, basically cut up Nashville to multiple Republican districts. And uh, now, given the Republicans a new seat, the 5th District is now Republican-leaning seat. They can see who their nominee is for that there. Uh, it'll be interesting to see as well here uh, other weeks coming up here. Uh, you know, uh, August 3rd, excuse me, uh, August 9th, uh, I believe there are some key primaries. As I look at the primary calendar dates here that I uh, have wanted here, yeah. Uh, August 9th, we'll have some interesting primaries. Wisconsin is on August 9th, as well as Minnesota and Connecticut. Uh, there'll be some interesting races to look at there when it comes to those nights. Uh, August 16th, uh, that is Liz Cheney's night. That's Wyoming's primary that night. So I'll be really interested to see that night as well. And then August 23rd, that's really the last big night we have. That's Florida and those New York congressional primaries that were delayed because of the uh, forced redraw of their maps. So really, we've kind of got the 9th, one state on the 16th in Wyoming, and then the 23rd. The 23rd is going to be our last big night of primaries before we drive into that uh, general election cycle. And we'll be talking to you throughout all of it. Uh, Joe Zemanski, always great stuff. Let everybody know about Elections-Daily, what you've got going on, uh, and where they can follow you on your social media until we get you back again. Yeah, so you can, uh, Elections-Daily, you can follow at Elections underscore Daily on Twitter. Uh, we do Every night there's election night. We'll, we'll be out there on la- live stream on our YouTube, Elections Daily, or on Twitter. Uh, we live stream there as well. And you can follow me at Joseph Samansky, all on word, 
That's S-Z-Y-M-A-N-S-K-I for the last name. Uh, Andrew, thank you for having me on once again tonight. We'll keep doing it. Uh, we uh, got all those things linked to the uh, show notes. You can find him and all his compatriots. They are a riot to watch. Always appreciate you, my friend. We'll talk again soon. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.